a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Kroger Tender Ray Beef, no other beef so fresh can be so tender, presents... Hearts in Harmony transcribed. K is for Kroger, C is for cut, B is for beef. KCB means Kroger cut beef, and Kroger cut beef means more meat for your money. That's right, ladies. Kroger cut beef gives you more meat, less waste. You see, before the meat is weighed and priced, the Kroger method of cutting beef removes excess bone, excess waste, and stringy ends. Yes, that's before the meat is weighed in price. And that's why Kroger Cut Beef gives you more meat for your money. It's top U.S. government grades of beef. Meat that's tender, juicy, rich red, and marbled with just the right amount of flavory fat. Yes, it's a better value in top grade beef. Now, for example, let's take a Kroger Cut sirloin steak. Before the steak is weighed in price... The Kroger method of cutting beef removes the stringy end, excess waste, and excess bone. So you get a better value because you don't pay steak price for stringy meat, excess bone, or waste. But whether you buy a steak or roast, you receive more meat, less waste. That's at your Kroger store. Visit your neighborhood Kroger store soon. Make it a rule to buy Kroger cut beef and get more meat for your money. And now, Hearts in Harmony. Penny Gibbs is coming home. They examined her at the Haverton Hospital this morning and said that she could leave. The ordeal of the accident is now behind her. Behind her, too, the suffering caused by her injuries and the tragedy of her fiancé, Barry Carlton's death. Today is Penny's last day as a patient. And in her room, Nurse Angela Brill says to her, Penny, we're going to try something now. Something we should have tried several days ago, but we didn't know you'd fare so well in the examination. Try what, Angela? Well, you've been sitting up for days with no ill effects, so now we're going to try letting you walk. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> it might not be, Penny. Just a few steps at first. No, sir, I'd do better than a few steps, Angela. Don't you dare try. Are you ready for a few steps? Oh, you bet I am. Oh, no, not so fast, Penny. In just a minute. You mustn't try this alone. Here, take hold of my arm. <sighs> All right, if I have to. <laughs> You'll want to once you're on your feet. Ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Now take a good, firm grip on my arm and lean on me all you want. Wait, here. I'll let you up a little. All right. <laughs> here. How does it feel to stand up? Oh, a little strange. Do you still think you can dance across the room and back again? No. No, I don't think so. I didn't think you would. Now, take a step. Just a small one. All right. There. Now another. Oh. I'm not very sure of myself, am I? <laughs> no one would expect you to be. Another step now. All right. I took two of them, Angela. Don't overdo it, please. Now, lean on me, Penny. Oh, I'm afraid I'll have to. This is almost like learning to walk all over again, isn't it? It's more than almost. I feel as though I've never walked in my life before. <laughs> well, you'll be all right again in four or five days. Or a week at the most. Now, let's turn around and go back to your chair again. Uh, yeah, I, I think we'd better. Careful now. Don't let go of me. I like to try a few steps alone, Angela. Not this time. Maybe later. Maybe you're right. Oh, that chair looks good. Don't hurry to it, Penny. Slow steps now. Slow. That's right. Now hold on to me while you lower yourself here in the chair. Ooh. I never knew a few steps could be such a problem. It's awfully good to sit down again. Penny, you don't feel faint, do you? No, just a little out of breath. I had no idea I was so weak. You'll get stronger every day. 
A week from now, you'll be walking around as if nothing had ever been the matter. I hope so. You will be. Being home will help as much as anything else. Well, I suppose so. Angela. Yes? You and Dr. Evans have been awfully nice to me. I'm very grateful for all he's done. And I do feel very close to you. I hope just because you're leaving us, it won't mean it's the last we'll see of you, Penny. I'll miss you terribly. Well, I'll miss you, too. I'm dying to get out of this place. I'm sick of it. I want to get out of it, but I'll still miss you. Maybe we'll see each other from time to time, always. I hope so. I'd like that. When I'm off duty, I'll try to come up and see you. Would that be all right? I'd be disappointed if you didn't. Because, Angela, I'm going to need somebody to talk to when I'm home. I'm sure you'll find a lot of people to talk to. No. No, not the way I'd like to talk. Not the things I want to talk about. I can tell you, Angela, because I know you understand. Much as I, I want to get out of here, I dread going home. The very thought of it terrifies me. I think I know why. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You're the only one who does. That's why I thought I could tell you, Angela. You know why I dread it. Because the worst is yet to come. Didn't you ever stop remembering? No, Penny. And I haven't to this day. But the memories are dulled, and when I look at a dance card or pressed flower now, I remember how sweet he was, and not that he's gone. If I could only forget that Barry's gone. But I guess I'll never be able to do it. Not at home. Every time the doorbell rings, I'll think of all the times that Barry rang. Every time I look out of my bedroom window, I'll look out the corner and wait to see his car turn into the street. Every time I see a mountain, and I can see the mountains from my bedroom window... I'll remember that Barry and I were going to live on one way up where the morning clouds were far below us. Not always, Penny, but for a while. But that while is going to seem like an eternity, I know. Angela, maybe I shouldn't go home. You have to, sometime. No matter when you go, it'll be just as painful. I think it's better to go home and get it over with. The sooner you get it over with, the sooner you'll be back to normal and stop seeing ghosts. That's what I'm afraid of. Ghosts and everything I, I see and do in every room and every turn. Everything around me holds a memory of him. A sweet memory one day. Penny, however sad it might be now. Angela, it's worse than sad. It's frightening. I, I don't mean that I'm afraid of Barry. It isn't that. It, but I'm afraid of myself. But what will those memories and, and reminders do to me? How can I... Have his death recall to me and, and not die inside myself. You will die inside, Penny, a thousand times, but that'll change and pretty soon you'll forget. Not Barry, but the sadness that goes with remembering him. Believe me, I went through it all with Robert. Go home, Penny. Try to make the best of it. You think I'll be able to get through it all right? What do you think? I don't know. I'm not sure. But I suppose if you can get through it, I i don't know why I can't. I was hoping you'd say that. I say it, but I, I don't know whether or not I'll be able to do it. Of course you will. And if I can help you in any way... Angela, I may need your help, but I don't want to put you to trouble. You've done much more than your share for me already. I want to keep on doing all I can. Please let me. The weeks and months ahead of you are going to be difficult to face alone. Oh, I'll have to face them, though, Angela. It's a strange thing, but... All our lives, we're all alone. No matter how many people there are around us, we're alone inside. We're something apart from everyone and everything in the world. When we're in trouble, we're more alone than ever. Oh, Angela, I may ask you to help me, but no one can help me if I can't first find some way to help myself. Nora, I'll finish back to being Penny's room. You've done enough oh, here. Oh, it's all done, Mrs. Schilling. You kept it this little bit. <laughs> Maybe that's why I offered to finish it for you. Oh, I haven't touched the rest of the house. <laughs> oh, here, 
it's all done in here. Oh, I spoke too soon, didn't I? Oh, I know you're going to the hospital, Mrs. Billings. I was just joking. Oh, I'm not going till this afternoon, so I'm going to help out today. I know you want the house sparkling for Penny. Oh, crickets, I do want it to look nice for you, too. <laughs> oh, when's Penny coming home tomorrow? I think so. I won't know definitely until I see Dr. Weston this afternoon. Oh, I hope it's tomorrow. She must be awfully anxious to get home. Oh, uh, I don't know, Nora. I'm not so sure about that. Well, crickets, why not? Well, she's not coming back to the things she left. Oh, we're the same. The house is the same. Sights and sounds are the same, but she'll look at them differently. And they'll have new meanings for her. I know why, too. Because Barry's gone. Because Barry's gone and all her hopes are gone. She's going to have a very hard time adjusting herself to life without him, Nora. It's going to be such a, well, such a trying ordeal. I know. Oh, Freddie and Johnny Keith and I were talking about sending Penny away on a trip with me, but... Well, I won't be able to go now, so I guess... Penny won't go anywhere, you know that. And she has to stay here, or near here, till she's ready to have something done about her face. Oh, Cricket, that's right. Really isn't going to be a very exciting homecoming for her, is it? No, I'm afraid not, dear. I guess I'm selfish or something. But I'm so happy about... Well, about things that... I sort of forget that other people are sad. With Penny so unhappy, I don't see why I have a right to... Oh, it's the old, old story, Nora. The balance of good and bad, of new and old, of life and death. You have every right to be happy, dear, because it's your turn for happiness. And Penny's turn for unhappiness. I know we all have to have a share of good and bad, but it just seems that Penny's never had her share of good. Life has always brought her close to happiness and then some way or another taken it away from her. There doesn't seem to be any reason for it. But there is, Nora. There's a reason for everything that happens to us, good and bad alike. But trying to see the reason for Penny's ill fortune isn't our problem. Our problem is to help her when she gets home. I know what you mean by help, too, Mrs. Billings. But what can we do? Just being cheerful around her isn't going to make her feel better. Well, what we have to do is to take her mind off the one thing it'll dwell on constantly. But, Mrs. Billings, you know she'll never stop thinking about it. She'll have to stop thinking about it, Nora, because the human mind can stand just so much. That's Dr. Weston's last fear for Penny. The danger now is mental. And we have to be her doctors and nurses and her medicine. Hello, Penny. Hello, Mother. Well, I understand you were walking around a little bit this morning. A very little bit. It was a lot more effort than I thought it would be. Well, in a week or two, you won't find it so difficult. I just talked to Dr. Weston, darling. It's definite. You're going home tomorrow. Oh, you're not too happy about going home, are you, Penny? You'd think there was something wrong with me if I weren't happy about it, wouldn't you? Oh, darling, you mustn't feel that way. And... Mother, I'm afraid. You don't know what's going on in my mind. You have no idea. And I guess I don't know how to describe it. I'll have to go home, Mother, because I have no other place to go to. But I don't know how long I'll be able to stand it. Penny Gibbs now faces the greatest ordeal of her life. How will she react to the heartbreaking memories of Barry Carlton when she returns to Rossville? Be sure to listen to the next dramatic episode of Hearts in Harmony. KCB, KCB, KCB means Kroger cut beef, and Kroger cut beef means more meat for your money. You see, Kroger cut beef gives you more meat, less waste, because before the meat is weighed and priced, the Kroger method of cutting beef removes excess bone, excess waste, and stringy ends. Yes, Kroger gives you more meat, less waste. And it's top U.S. government grades of beef, tender, juicy, rich red, and marbled with just the right amount of flavory fat. So visit your Kroger store soon. Order your favorite cut of steak or roast. If you buy a Kroger cut round steak or roast... Notice that the Kroger method of cutting beef gives you a minimum of bone and removes excess waste before the steak or roast is weighed and priced. Remember, whether you buy a steak or roast, Kroger cut beef gives you more meat for your money. 
It's your last chance. The great Kroger Hot Dated Coffee Contest ends at midnight tonight. So hurry, hurry. See if you can win a big, luxurious Hudson sedan. An Alaska sealskin fur coat valued at $1,400. A Westinghouse laundromat roaster or adjustomatic iron. In five weekly contests, Kroger is awarding 1,160 prizes. And the final week's contest closes at midnight tonight. Get your entry blank with full details at your Kroger store and enter now. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station, for another exciting transcribed chapter of Hearts in Harmony. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. You receive a report that a circus truck has been broken into. Several of the animals are missing. Some of them are dangerous. Your job, find them. It was Monday, May 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stab Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back to Superior Court, and it was 11.46 a.m. when I got to room 40. Auto theft. Hi. How'd it go? Well, his lawyer's got a continuance. Yeah? How come? I don't know. New evidence they want to introduce. What's the DA's office say? There's nothing they can say. It comes under the heading in due process, you know. Yeah. You think he's going to nail him? Alex thinks so. The guy's admitted his guilt. Now he's claiming the confession is a lot of bunk. Says we got it out of him by force. Hmm. Why now? Prove he did it without the confession, I guess. Shouldn't be too hard. We got all the evidence. We get the chance to lay it out for the jury. Yeah. When do you go back? Let's see. Set it off for uh, a week, I guess, yeah. Anything come in? No, not big. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Something we can do for you? I should report something stolen. All right, sir. Just come on in. Sure get serious around here. All right, sir. Now, what kind of a car was it? Uh, ain't no car. Big pardon? No car stolen. Stuff in the car. All right. What was it? Well, it wasn't really a car anyway. A truck. That's where they stole it from, a truck. All right. If you'll give us a description. As far as I know, they might not have stolen it anyway. Might just have opened it and let them all out. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, the sooner we get this report filled out, the faster we can start looking for the stolen merchandise. Yeah. Just out of that myself. Should have. All right, sir. Now, what's your name? Clarence Havel. H-A-V-I-L-L. No R. Most people put an R in it. Havel. <laughs> it ain't. It's Havel. Mm-hmm. Where'd the theft take place? Corner of Fountain de Long Prix. Right on the corner there. Just south of the red zone on Fountain. Mm-hmm. All right, sir. What was taken? You see, I got this call from one of the drivers who works for my brother and me. Drives one of our trucks. Called and said the machine broke down. Wanted me to bring another tractor over. Well, we can get to all that later, Mr. Havel. Now, what were the stolen articles? Animals. Sir? Animals from our carnival. What kind of animals? Oh, a couple of monkeys. Cody Mundy. Two raccoons. All right, sir. Anything else? Yeah, here comes the bad part. This is what I was afraid of. What's that, sir? It's the reason I waited so long to report it. I thought maybe he'd turn up. What's that, sir? A black panther. We got a description of the animals, and the local broadcast was gotten out on them immediately. 12, 18 p.m. We continue to talk to Clarence Havel. Friday night. That's when it happened. What time, Friday night? About 7.05 or 7.10, right after the fights went on. That's when the phone rang. I see. I was kind of sore about being interrupted when the fights was on. I always watch them. Most of my friends know not to call me then. Yes, sir. Well, anyways, the phone rang. I got up and went over to answer it. It was Bert. Who was Bert? Uh, Bert Newell. He's well, a driver. Oh, I see. Said he had a breakdown at Fountain de Long Creek. Asked me if I had an extra tractor. It happened, I did. Uh-huh. Bert asked me to bring it over. Said he wanted to use it to get the show to Nevada. So you drove over then, huh? Not right away. How's that? Well, it looks like the fight wasn't going to last much longer, and I wanted to see the finish of it. So I stuck around for a couple more rounds. After that, I left. Uh-huh. Drove over and found Bert right on the corner, just standing there, not trying to do nothing about the breakdown, just standing there. Yes, sir. 
Well, you just bet I read him off. Told him the least he could have done was get out of ranch or something and try to find the trouble. And I read him off good. Yes, sir. Didn't do no good. He's shiftless, you know. Real shiftless. Yes, sir. You know Bert, do you? No, sir. Shiftless. You know him, you know that. You want to go on, please? Oh, yeah. Well, we got the trailer on the hitch, and the tractor hooked up. Only took a couple of minutes, and got it done, and Bert took off. Where was he going, you know? Over to Nevada. Going to play a show there. Overton. Going to play a show there. Yes, sir. Right by Lake Mead, Overton. Yes, sir. When did you find out the animals were missing? When I got the wire from my brother. That's when I got the first inkling. When was that? Last night. Company phoned me about, oh, I guess it was about 8.30. I see. You have the telegram? No. I told you they phoned it. Uh, what did it say? Just the animals are gone from my brother. Said that the animals were on the truck when it got to Overton. Uh huh. Told me about how the rocks on a couple of the cages was busted and smashed and the animals was gone. Well, now, sir, is it possible that the cages might have been broken into some other place than Los Angeles? Might be, yes, might be. Ain't likely. So why do you say that? Only reason I know of, because it ain't likely. Not only that, I got proof of it. How do you mean, sir? Well, as soon as I got the wire, I went down to Fountain de Long Cree. Went right there and looked around. Uh-huh. Figured I might as well go down there and look around. I might find something, you know. Took a big four-cell flash, went down the corner. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was right. That's where it happened. Yeah, that's where they got away. Found a spoor, you know. I beg your pardon? Spoor. Tracks. Found them all over the place. Oh, I see. Of the panther? No, raccoons. Oh, Not only that, I found something else. Yes, sir. Monkeys. Found them, too. Well, where were they? Phone pole, right up on the top, just sitting there shivering. They kind of little, you know. Get real cold easy. We have them around the place. They wear little sweaters. Get chilly real easy. How about the rest of the animals? You see any sign of them? No, I went over to a little store near there and got a head of lettuce. 17 cents. Took it back to the phone pole, showed it to Caesar and Salome. Oh, they love lettuce. Is that the monkeys? Yeah, Mama's a white-eared. Love lettuce. Hmm. They came right down into the... Yeah, right down the pole. Slithered right for the lettuce. And they were scared stiff. Being up there on that pole all night, should have had their sweaters. <laughs> what about the other animals? Uh, not a sign of them. Just the spore of the raccoons. Haven't got the slightest idea where they might have gone. No real problem, no, not them. Uh, how do you mean? Easy to replace. Oh. Go up in the Hollywood Hills, lots of them there. Run all over the place upsetting garbage cans. <laughs> Imagine some of the people would be glad to have me come up there and take them away. <laughs> yeah, raccoons ain't no problem. Well, Mr. Havel, what about the panther? Well, he's a problem. Yes, sir. Can you give us a description of the animal? Yeah, he's black. Yes, sir. Like the inside of a well, jet black. Even blacker than that ink they're talking about. Mm -hmm. About seven feet long. Oh, easy that. Yes, sir. That's counting the tail. Seven feet. Anything else about him that we should know? Mm, no, just a plain black panther, nothing special. Is he dangerous? Well, not unless he meets somebody. Dandy's got a temper. That's the name of the animal, is it, Dandy? Yeah. Maybe that because he's blacker than the pits of the inferno. <laughs> Dandy. You're pretty sure he got out of that truck when the monkeys did, huh? Well, I ain't going to give you no written guarantee, but I'm sure of it. All right, sir. We'll start looking for him right away. Well, Mr. Havel, where were these animals coming from? Winter quarters. The standard ordering is going to be our first, just starting the season. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else you can tell us that'll make it easier to find the panther? Mm, no, not a thing. Just be careful, that's all. Don't hurt him. He's really as gentle as a kitten when you get to know him, like a big overgrown cat. Gentle. Yes, sir. That's something Clyde didn't understand. Who's Clyde, sir? My brother Clyde. Oh, I see. He didn't like Dandy. Didn't understand him. That's what caused the trouble. What was that? Last winter, Clyde came to see the show, tell me about the bookings. Yes, sir. We discussed about how the best way to exhibit Dandy would be, and Clyde got too close to the cage. Yeah. Dandy almost killed him. All officers in the area where the panther had escaped were notified, and an additional team of men were called from Metropolitan Reserve to patrol the vicinity. The presence of the animal on city streets presented a very real menace to all citizens in the city. A team of detectives from auto theft detail were dispatched to the corner of Fountain and DeLong Prey to talk to the people who lived in the area. However, they were unable to come up with any new information on the escaped panther. Frank and I talked to Chief of Detectives Thad Brown and with Captain Nelson. 
was decided to start a block-by-block search for the missing camp. Authorities from the Griffith Park Zoo were consulted as to the possible hiding places of the animal. When the afternoon newspapers hit the streets, calls began to flood the complaint board asking for additional information on the panther. Local radio and television broadcasts carried stories about the escape and the number of calls went up. Additional men had to be called to care for the switchboard. The search went on. Frank and I worked in the field along with the other men from auto theft detail and officers from Metro Division. Every possible hiding place in the vicinity of Fountain and DeLong Creek was searched without turning up any new information on the camp. It was the opinion of authorities that the panther might try to hide in the brush of the Hollywood Hills, and the search was moved to that vicinity. Tuesday, May 12th, Frank and I got back to the office from the area. We'd been up all night looking for the animal. You want to check with the skipper? Anybody around who can bring in some coffee? Well, I'll call Sal. He'll bring some over. That'll be a good idea. Ask him to send over a sandwich, too. Yeah, what kind you want? I don't care. Just tell him to make sure the coffee's hot. Yeah. Yes, sir? I'd like to talk to the men who are working on the panther thing. Yes, sir. Come right in. Go right, right, right. the end of the hall. I'd find him here. Well, I'm yeah, Sergeant Sally. Right. Maybe I can help you. You working with the search party? Yes, sir. My partner and I have been out with him. Have they oh, caught right. it yet? No, sir. Not yet. They know where it is? Coffee. Well, no, sir, we don't. Coffee. That's what I thought. I'm Sidney Norton. I live in this town. Yes, sir. Got a family. I pay taxes. Uh-huh. Just want to ask one oh, question. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Now, according to papers, it's okay. Havel or whatever his name is. He owns the Panther. Is that right? His name's Clarence Havel. But he owns the cat. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, I want his address. Beg your pardon? I want the number of his house. That's simple, isn't it? Well, we're not allowed to give that out. I'm sorry. All I want is his address so I can go over there and punch him right in the nose. You going to give it to me? No, sir. Who's your superior? Captain Nelson. Well, where is he? I want to talk to him. He's in Chief Brown's office right now. Well, where's that? Down at the end of the hall, office number 26. All right, I'll talk to him. I want that man's address, and I want it now. Terrible thing for the law to allow a person to keep animals like that so they can get away and walk around killing anybody they meet. If you cops can't do anything about it, I can. You can just bet I can. Well, if you go out and cause Mr. Havel any trouble, you're liable for arrest, sir. By whom? Any policeman that he wants to call. Well, you protect him, but you don't care about me and my family, is that it? No, sir. You've both got right to protection under the law. Now, if Havel's done anything, we'll take care of it. When? As soon as we find that panther. Well, you may just be wrong. I've been talking around. There are a lot of people who feel like I do. A lot of them. Enough, maybe, to decide to do things our way. Well, I wouldn't try it, Mr. Norton. Too late, mister. You can't do anything about it. We will. Me and my friends, we'll take care of it. It's out of your hands. We'll take care of Havel. Take care of him good. I wouldn't make book on that. Who's going to stop us? Like I told you, any cop that Havel calls. <laughs> Frank and I talked to Sidney Norton, and we finally convinced him that any action he might take would not help the situation. We sent him home, and then we met with Captain Nelson and Chief Brown. The progress of the search was reviewed, and it was decided to continue it in the Lake Hollywood area and in the upper grip of Park Hill. All days off had been canceled, and additional officers were joining in the hunt for the Panther. After the meeting, Frank and I got some breakfast, and then we drove out to Clarence Havel's home. It was a large ranch house at the corner of Victory Boulevard and Monterey Avenue out in the San Fernando Valley. We drove through the gate and parked the car. Clarence Havel was sitting on the large porch waiting for us. A small monkey was sitting on his shoulder. Hi, come on up and sit down. Yes, sir. How's it going, Mr. Friday? Mr. Smith? All right, sir. Pretty good, sir. Get you anything? Glass of ginger beer, maybe? Got some cold in the icebox? No, sir, no thanks. Heard from my brother this morning. All right. Mm-hmm. In Nevada. Got a telegram. Company phoned it to me again. Good news. What's that, sir? Well, it begins to look like it's all a mistake. Sir? The whole thing. Looks like the animals didn't get away here in Los Angeles. Why do you say that? Well, it's a telegram from my brother. Says they found the Cody Monday and one of the raccoons in Baker, California. Found them alongside the road. Tired and hungry. <laughs> Guess they're sorry now they got out of the truck. Well, how about the panther? Any word on him? No, not yet, but Clyde set some men out to look for it. Sure Danny will turn up. How well, can we get in touch with your brother, Havel? Can't. What? Can't get in touch with him. Out in the desert looking for Dandy. Out of touch. Can you give us the address of your winter quarters here in town? I can't do that, Mr. Friday. Why not? You don't know him. Well, sir, you run a circus and you don't know where the animals are kept? You're well, not really a circus. It's a carnival. Yes, sir, we understand. But what's the address? I don't know. Do you have any idea? Not the least. And you can't tell us where to reach your brother? He's out looking for Danny. Well, how about it, Havel? Something that you're not telling us? Havel? Yeah. Well, is there? We haven't got no regular winter quarters. Not regular set up. That's why I can't tell you where it is. Mm-hmm. Ain't none. All right, go ahead. 
You see, the Havel Amalgamated Combined Show is really a gypsy carnival. How do you mean that? Well, we ain't got no big operation. A couple of mangy animals. We don't have a license to keep them in the city. Only quarters we got are vacant lots. We set up and stay there until the neighbor starts complaining and we move on. Trucks for the show are registered in states where the fee is smallest and we got about every deal we could to keep the cost of operation down. Now, what about the panther? Andy? Yes, sir. Only real attraction we got. Man killer. I told you about how he almost got Clyde, didn't I? I told you that. Yes, sir. Gotta understand, Daddy, or nothing works with him. Is that right? Might be something about Dandy. Could be our officer. We gave him this number. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Hello? Yeah, this is number. Huh? Yeah, just a minute. Uh, you see you, Mr. Friday, your office. Thank you. Thank you very much. No trouble at all. I'd like to do what I can. Yes, yeah, sir. Friday. Yes, Skipper. That's right. Well, you want to give me that address? I checked out, did it? Uh huh. No, we'll get right over. Frank, let's go. Good news? Well, we're not sure yet. Huh? They say they found the panther. The address we'd gotten on the telephone was in the Hollywood Hills just off Beechwood Drive. Frank and I drove down the freeway, turned off at Gower, up Franklin to Beechwood, and we continued up to Ledgewood Drive. By the time we got there, other units had arrived, and the immediate vicinity where the animal had been seen was surrounded. From one of the officers, we got the story. The panther had been seen by one of the civilians searching the area. The animal had run between two houses and jumped through a window into a ground floor garage. We checked the house, but we found that the occupants were not there. Because of the danger of the panther's presence and the difficulty of taking it alive, it was decided to try to shoot it. The officers involved in the search were armed with large caliber weapons. Frank and I took two sawed-off shotguns, and we approached the door leading to the garage. Who's covering the window? Mac. All right. I'll hit the door. Stand back. We'll try to see what's inside. Okay. I can't see anything from the window. No. Yeah. Might be behind those boxes at the rear there. Yeah. You all set? Yep. Yeah. No. Cases. Looks like something there. Well, you can take that sign. All right. Take it easy. Sure. You don't have to spell it. Hi, right, Frank. Right from where you are, can you tip those boxes over there? Yeah, I think so. Well, let's try it. Maybe it'll drive them out in the open. All right. Well, there he is. Yeah. Looks pretty mean. The event was similar to several that had happened during the hunt for the Black Panther. During the 20-odd hours we'd been looking for the animal, there'd been several reports that seemed authentic enough to be checked out. All of them turned out to be false. By this time, there were over 300 officers engaged in the search. Frank and I went back to the office and put in a call to the telegraph company in an effort to find Clyde Havel. They checked through their files, but they were unable to find any record of any wires. We then put in a call to the California-Nevada border station in an attempt to get information. Yes, sir, that's right. Apple amalgamated combined shows. What? R-E-L-E. A, V Victor, I, L, L. Apple. Mm -hmm. Well, what we got, it should have come through Saturday the 13th. No, it might have been Sunday the 14th. You pretty sure about that, are you? Was it possible? All right, I understand. Okay, thank you. If anything turns up, will you call us? Friday, extension 2507. That's auto theft detail. Right. Thanks again. Bye. How about it? They got a record of the show going through? They never heard of it. We immediately put in a call to the authorities in Baker, California. We talked with members of the State Highway Patrol, and from them we obtained the information that there had been no stray animals captured in the vicinity during the past few days. The conversation with them lengthened the possibility that the story we'd gotten from Clarence Havel was a lie. We checked his house, but Havel wasn't there. 
From his neighbors, we obtained the name of his sister. 6.10 p.m. We drove out to the address, a two-family stucco duplex. We rang the bell and we waited. Yes? Miss Havel? That's right. What is it you want? The police officer. Frank Smith, my name's Friday. Hello. How do you do, ma'am? What is it you want? We'd like to talk to you about your brother. Clyde? No, ma'am. Clarence. Mr. Friday, I've done what I can for him. If he's in trouble again, he's just going to have to go it alone. What if we could talk inside? Well, come on in. Thank you very much. What's you done this time? Beg your pardon? What's my brother done this time? Does your brother own a circus? Is this a joke? No, ma'am. It's pretty serious, does he? Sure. Big one. Havel's amalgamated and combined shows. Travels all over the country. Animals, concessions. Even got a man-eating black panther. Yes, ma'am. That's one of the things we want to find out about. Dandy? You know the animal, do you? Oh, Clarence's friends do. Talks about him all the time. Do you know where the circus is right now? Same place it's always been. Ma'am. Yeah. Never been any place else. Yeah. In Clarence's head. <laughs> continued to talk to Lillian Havel. From her, we got the background of the story. She told us that her brother had been a press agent for one of the larger carnivals, but that he'd been discharged several years before. Since that time, he talked of very little else but the day when he'd be able to start his own show starring Danny, the man killing Black Panther. She went on to tell us that he spent most of his time in the hills of the San Fernando Valley trapping small animals preparing for the first tour of the carnival. We called the office and notified them. The search for the Black Panther was called off. 8.46 p.m. We left the duplex and we drove out the freeway to the valley. When we got to Havel's, he was sitting on the front porch reading. The monkey was still on his shoulder. Hey, come back, huh? Yes, sir. Found Andy yet? Sure hope you come up with him. I hate to lose the main attraction. Ain't had any word of him yet, huh? No. Yeah, uh, he's a sly one, old Dandy. Sly. He knows if you find him, he'll go back in the cage. <laughs> you just keep looking, though. He'll turn up. Search has been called off, Havel. Called off? That's right. You mean you quit looking? That's right. Well, you can't do that. You can't. Dangerous animal like that loose in the city, all the people in dire danger. You can't call off the posse. Why don't you tell us about it? What do you mean? All right, Havel. Tell us why you did it. Huh? Why'd you report the panther being gone? Because she was. Wanted to save all the people from dire danger. Why don't you tell us the truth? Huh? We've checked your story. It's a pack of lies, you know. Now, just a minute. Ain't no man that says I tell lies. No man. You say you got two telegrams from your brother, is that right? Mm, yeah, from Clyde. Well, we checked with the telegraph company. They've got no record of any such messages. Hey, it's, it's a big company. They might have lost them. No, I don't think they lost them. Might have. You told us the carnival truck went into Nevada, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah. Well, we checked at the border. They don't know anything about the show. Well, a lot of roads into Nevada. Maybe you called the wrong station. Well, we talked to the right one. Big truck, red and yellow. Have us combined amalgamated shows. Letters about mm, this big. On the side, yellow letters, got a picture of Dandy on the side. Oh, mean, you can almost count his teeth. You told us the truck was registered in your name. DMV has no record of it. Mm, must be some mistake. It's got to be wrong. We talked to your sister. She tells you don't have any kind of a show. Lillian said that? That's what she said. You here, too? Yes, sir. Lillian told you I didn't have no show? Lillian told you that? Well, you get your coat, Hal. Huh? A little cold out tonight. You might need a coat. We going someplace? Yes, yeah, so we're going to have to take you downtown. Why? Well, you've had half the city on a wild goose chase here. Caused a lot of people a lot of work. Turns out there was no reason for it. We're trying to find out why you did it. Why? Yes, sir. You ever wanted anything bad, Sergeant? What? You ever wanted something so bad you'd almost taste it? Get to a point where you, you think about it so much, pretty soon it don't come over like a dream anymore. It, it's real. Honest and true, real. You ever want anything like that? I wouldn't know. Well, that's the way it was with Havel's Amalgamated Combined Shows. That's the way it was. I was weaned on sawdust. Been around it all my life. The animals, sideshows, the alley, all of it. Been my whole life. When I left it, it seemed like I jumped into a big hole that didn't have no bottom. Wasn't anything to hang on to. Nothing to tie down to, you know? Mm-hmm. Always I had in the back of my head that I could, I could do it again. I was a good publicity man. Good. Used to pack the man. Never no trouble getting the people in when I was there. When I left, I, I, I knew I'd be back. I knew it with my own show. Have those amalgamated combined shows the biggest in the world. 
I guess I just got so that I believed it too much and lost the line between what's real and what I was dreaming. Mm-hmm. It was this morning when you was out here. Remembered and tried to stop you from going on, but tried and then there's that phone call where they found Daddy and didn't seem right to stop things then, just didn't seem right. All right, you want to get your coat? Yeah. Are you going to take me downtown to the police car? That's right. Can you use a siren? For what, sir? Siren. There's no reason for any siren. Uh, I suppose not. Used to have sirens when I come to town. Me and the chief of police ride down the street. Siren going. Everybody knew I was in town. Big to do. Everybody knew I was there. Things have sure changed. Not very much. Yeah, things have changed. People used to know I was in town. They still do. Clarence Neal Havel was held over for a sanity hearing in Superior Court. On recommendation of the court, appropriate action was taken. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Treasury Department presents Guest Star with Harry Sosnick and the Defense Bonds Orchestra, yours truly, John Conti, and starring Jack Webb. <laughs> How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is John Conti, your host for Guest Star, a transcribed feature for Defense Bonds, presented by this station as a public service. Your maturing Series E defense bonds can go right on earning interest for you for as much as 10 years longer. If you don't need the cash right now, hold those bonds at interest and keep on buying more defense bonds through the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank. In a moment, we'll introduce Jack Webb. First, Harry Sosnick and the Defense Bonds Orchestra present Harry's own arrangement of the stirring... Lady of Spain.
Thank you, Harry. And now our guest, the popular young dramatic star of radio, motion pictures, and television, Jack Webb. He appears in an original guest star sketch entitled, By Mere Coincidence. We take you now to Hollywood and Jack Webb. My name's Christopher Adams. I'm 32 years of age, 5 feet 11, 172 pounds, black hair. I'm a salesman with Durham Industrial Supply. Two days ago, I came to Washington, D.C. to wrap up some last-minute business before beginning a much-needed two-week vacation. On the run from Washington, D.C. back to New York, that's where the whole incident began. The incident that almost cost me my freedom. A couple of minutes out of Washington, I thought I could feel somebody standing next to the empty seat beside me. It was a fat man, expensively dressed. Before he sat down, he tossed his briefcase up next to mine on the bag rack. I settled my head back against the seat and started thinking about that two-week vacation. Well, the train bell woke me up. We'd stopped. We were in Pennsylvania Station. The seat next to me was empty. The fat man was gone. I yanked my briefcase down from the bag rack and headed up the ramp for the cab stand. It was 11.30 when the cab dropped me off in front of my apartment building. I let myself into my room, flipped the light switch, tossed my briefcase on the bed, and that's when I saw him. The gold initials on the case. Initials J.G. The fat man had picked up my briefcase, and I picked up his. Well, in mine, there was nothing of real value, but what about the fat man? What did it contain? might hold something very important. I had to get in touch with him immediately. I tried the lock on the case, and it snapped open. I took out the contents. First, a sheaf of papers that contained some kind of odd drawing sketches of some kind. And then my hand closed around the steel barrel of a gun. Well, the drawings looked like floor plans. A photograph that slipped out of the drawings told me what plan. Just a minute. Mr. Adams? Yes, I'm... In charge, please. Well, what's going on here? Come on, Gregor. He's here. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, good. Now, look, I don't know what this is Close all Close the door, Maxi. Yes, come on, Gregor. Ah. I see you have examined the contents of my briefcase, Mr. Adams. Well, I was only trying to find out who the case belonged to. Please, Mr. Adams. How well did you examine the contents? You know them well enough to go to the police? And I look here. I don't know what you're talking about. All I did was... Of course not. You are stupid. So stupid. You Americans make many heroics when the so-called cheap are down. No, let me... Not here, Maxim. You this time. Put the papers back in the briefcase. Yes. What are you trying to do here? Who? In good time, you show me, Mr. Adams. In good time. Ready, Maxim? Yes, come on, Gregor. Good. Now, Mr. Adams, uh, you will come along with manner for I promise you a short life. Shall we go? Well, the fat man Gregor and his accomplice herded me out of the apartment, down into their car. At the curb, they put a blindfold over my eyes and told me to keep quiet. Two minutes later, I'd lost all sense of direction. Fifteen minutes later, the car came to a stop. I was roughly guided up some squeaky wooden steps and ushered into a warm room. Take the blindfold off, Maxie. Yes, come right. There. That is better, is it not, Mr. Adam? So... How do you like your new home for the next few days? It's just fine. Now, look, what's this all about? See, you are not stupid after all, Mr. Adams. Well, I surveyed the room with a lone lamp on the table. A table that stood between Gregor and myself. Maxine was moving toward me. In his hand, he held a gun. Well, I thought it was now or never, so I made a pass at the table. <laughs> the light! Get me, Maxine! Yes, come here! I hit Gregor from behind. I heard him hit the floor. And then I caught the outline of Maxime against the window. I dived for him. I yanked his arms around behind his back and forced him around in front of him. He's here, come on, Gregor. He's here. Maxime. Maxime, where are you? He's dead, Gregor. Where are you? Speak again. I got your partner's gun, Gregor. Speak again, fool. Oh, no. You're the fool, Gregor. When are you guys going to wise up? You're not going to rule the world. Doesn't your comrade know that? There are too many free men who love freedom. Free men are simple fools who only know the simple things. 
Your speed bores me. No, it doesn't bore you, Gregor. It hurts you. Destroy the free. That's your five-year plan. Well, let me tell you something. For every free man you destroy, there'll be two more to take his place. You're nothing but a hot-headed salesman trying to impress me with your schoolboy heroic. You know, Gregor, I was just thinking. If I die here, I really got a lot more to lose than you. Wait, wait. Uh, Mr. Adams, there is no need for these heroic. Nobody's trying to be a hero. Let us have a pot. Yeah, sure. You guys are famous for your parlays, aren't you? Wait, look. I throw down my gun. You have it? You did the same. Yeah. Good. Now open the door so we have some luck. Sure. You fit this. You didn't think I trusted you, did you, comrade? I'm... I'm dying. I... No, you'll live. I'm not that good a shot. Oh. Now you're going to live. Wait till the boy hear that, huh? No. Oh. Oh. Yeah, Comrade Gregor. You're going to live. Well, I'm on my vacation. I'm enjoying the so-called simpler things in life. The beach, the sun, the cool drinks, and the pretty girls. Yeah, the simple things. Enjoyed only by free men. That was a fine performance, Jack Webb, as always. Well, thank you, Ted. Of course, the same for you. And I enjoy doing it, and it's especially nice to be appearing on a defense bond program again. You picked a good time for your return appearance, Jack, because now you know defense bonds are a better investment than ever. Yeah, I know that, Ted. I've always been a strong believer in defense bonds because they're a safe and sure investment. And with the new features, well, they're now even better. But the most important thing to me is the fact that bonds provide a perfect way to save, not only for your own future security but for your country's defense as well. Right. Defense bonds are now even better. Now defense bonds pay more interest and have a shorter maturity period. Two, we can all play a part in our country's defense effort by signing up for the payroll savings plan or the bond a month plan. Those two automatic plans that make saving easy and systematic. Yes, these automatic plans make it possible to save before we spend, and that's important. So, friends, may I suggest that you sign up today for your country's defense and your own future security by enrolling in the payroll savings plan to buy defense bonds. There's no better investment in the world. Thank you, Jack Webb. And now Harry Sosnick leads the defense bonds orchestra in a musical finale, Johnny Green's unforgettable Body and Soul. <laughs>
You have been listening to Guest Star, a transcribed feature for defense bonds presented by this station each week as a public service. Our thanks to Jack Webb for a fine performance and to his supporting players, Ted DeCorsia and Fritz Feld, and his director, Louis Graff. Next week, we'll have another favorite star and more good music by Harry Sosnick and the Defense Bonds Orchestra. So we hope you'll be with us. In the meantime, this is John Conti saying so long and reminding you that regular savings today means security tomorrow. Invest in defense bonds where you work or bank. Sergeant, you're assigned a robbery detail. A special officer has been shot during a routine patrol. His assailants have escaped into the city. There's no lead to their whereabouts. Your job, find them. It was Saturday, May 21st. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss of Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way back from the scene, and it was 10.56 p.m. when we got to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Treatment room. That you, doctor? No, ma'am. Police officers. Doctor said we could ask you some questions. About the robbery? Yes, ma'am. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Hello, Miss Montgomery. You heard anything about Keith? Is he all right? Well, the doctor's still with him. Is he going to be all right? We better talk to the doctor about that, I think. He tried to stop the men from robbing us. He tried to throw him out of the store. Yes, ma'am. Now, can you tell us what happened? Well, I guess so. The doctor said I could. Well, any time you don't feel like going on, just tell us, please. All right. What time did the man come into the store? About 9.30, right around in there. Yeah. Keith and me were sitting in the back room playing cribbage. We usually play a couple of games before we close up, especially when business is kind of slow. Uh-huh. These two men came in. Keith went out to wait on them. Did you go with him? No, wasn't any reason to. Just two customers, no reason for me to go out. Looked like they came in together. You could see him from where you were, huh? Oh, yes. We had the card table set up right in the doorway of the back room. All right, ma'am. Would you like to go on? Well, Keith went out and asked him what they wanted. Yeah. One of them said he wanted a bottle of vodka. Keith asked him what kind, and the man said it didn't make any difference, said he wanted a hundred proof, though. Uh-huh. Keith got the bottle off the shelf and came back. Told the man how much the bottle was, and that's when the other man pulled out the knife. They say the second man drew the knife. Huh? That's right. Short fellow. Had this kind of knife with a spring blade where you push a button and the blade snaps out, you know how? Yes, ma'am. Did the men know you were in the back room? They must have. All they had to do was look through the door and they'd have seen me. I wasn't trying to hide. All right. Feel like going on? Uh, yes. The doctor gave me some kind of pill. It makes me a little numb, but I feel all right. All right. You can please go ahead. Now, what happened after they pulled this knife? Well, the short one told Keith to give him the money. Said it was a holdup. Could you remember his exact words? Oh, I don't know. It seems he said... All right, old man, this is a stick-up. Put all the money in the register in a paper bag and don't cause any trouble. This is near as I can remember. That's what he said. All right, what happened then? Well, Keith told him to get out of the store. Said the two of them were too young to get mixed up in that kind of foolishness. Told him to get right out. Yeah. Little fella, the short one with the knife, grabbed Keith and told him they weren't playing games. But if he knew what was good for him, he'd do like he was told. Had the knife right at his chest. He was going to cut Keith. Mm-hmm. That's when I came out of the back room when I thought they were going to hurt Keith. All right. You go on, please. Uh, yes. I want to get this over and tell you what you need to know so you can catch the fellow. All right, ma'am. What happened when you came into the store? Well, I tried to get the men out of the place. Told them that if they knew what was good for them, they'd leave right then. Uh-huh. Might as well have been talking to a wall. They didn't pay any attention to me. Yeah. Well, that's when I tried to get to the phone. I wanted to call the police. 
What was your husband doing at this time? Standing there trying to keep from moving into the knife. This short little fellow had it pressed right against his chest. Had the point right here. Keith made any kind of a move, he'd have been stabbed. When they saw me go to the phone, the tall one grabbed me and hit me with his fist closed. Hit me about as hard as he could. As soon as he did that, Keith seemed to go crazy. Wrenched himself away from the one with the knife and jumped on the tall man, fought him as hard as he could. Yeah. Terrible the way it happened. Yes, ma'am. The tall man hit Keith along the neck with the edge of his hand and knocked my husband down. Then the little fellow jumped on him. Held his knife right at his throat and told him to take the money and put it in a bag. That he didn't want any more trouble or he'd kill us both. All the time he had the knife right here at Keith's throat. Yes, ma'am. Your husband did what they said? That's right. He opened the register and gave him the money, put it in a paper bag. I thought they'd leave after that, but they didn't. Only made a matter. Why was that, you know? It wasn't enough money. Only about 30 or $35. They said we had more in the back room. They wanted that, too. Said for us to get it or they'd kill us. Well, did you get it for them? Yes. I went back and took it out from where we hid it. Handed it right over. Mm-hmm. What did the doctor say about Keith? He must have said something. Frank, would you check with Dr. Sebastian and see what's going on in there? Yeah, well. Would you go on, please? After they got the other money, the two men left the store. Put the cash in the paper bag and walked out. Said for me to stay still for five minutes or they'd come back and kill Keith and me. Mm-hmm. When did the special officer come into the store? We didn't. Ma'am? He drove up when we were arguing with the men on the sidewalk. And after they left the store, Keith got up and ran after them, tried to hold them. Well, did the officer know what was going on? No, not at first. He thought it was just an argument. When he walked up... Keith tried to tell him that the store was being robbed, but the tall robber said it was just a personal fight. That it didn't concern anybody else but Keith and him. Were you on the sidewalk at the time? Yes, right beside Keith. I see. Robert said that Keith was just an old crackpot trying to cause trouble, that the officer should forget about it. Yeah. I guess it didn't sound very good to him, because he said it'd be better if Keith and the men talked to a policeman. That's when the tall hold-up man grabbed the gun and shot. At the officer? Yes. Grabbed the gun out of his holster and shot him in the stomach. What happened then? The smaller of the two stabbed Keith a couple of times. And both of them ran down the street. Did you see where they went? Yes. They got into a car that was parked about a half a block away. Jumped into the car and left. All right, Miss Montgomery, just a couple more questions now. Did either of the two men use a name at any time? What do you mean? Well, when they were talking to each other, did they use a name of any kind? Do you remember? Yes. When they shot the officer, the big one, he did the shooting. He said, come on, Hank, let's get out of here. Like that, he said it. I see. Now, was there anything outstanding about the two men that you can remember? Anything that would make them easier for us to identify? Oh, I can't think of anything right off. Just that one was tall and the other one was short. That's all I can think of. About how tall, do you remember? The big one? Yes. Oh, over six feet. I'd say he was about six feet three, maybe even more. Mm Mm-hmm. Did he have any special marks or scars that you can recall? No, no, nothing like that. Now, how about the short one? Anything to make it easier for us to identify him? Just his fingernails. How do you mean? They looked like he'd never cleaned them. Real long and dirty, I remember that. Was there anything else? No. Did either of them speak with any kind of an accent, would you remember? No. Sounds just like anybody else. Nothing special about him. I see. Joe. Yeah, Frank. See you in a minute. Yeah. Did you find out about Keith? Did you talk to the doctor? He'll be right in to see him as much. Is Keith right? going to be all right? Why don't you tell me what's happening? Try to take it easy, ma'am. The doctor will be right in. All right, but time to hurry, please. Please. Yes, yeah, we'll do that. Did you call County? Yeah. They're operating on home. How's he doing? Well, as soon as they get the bullet out, he should make it. Wound's not serious. What about Keith Montgomery? He just died. Knife wound. <laughs> The story we'd gotten from Irene Montgomery was pretty much the same as Special Officer Kenneth Holman had given us. Immediately after the robbery, a local and an APB had gone out on the suspects. In canvassing the neighborhood, the investigating officers had found two eyewitnesses to the shooting stabbing. A man and a woman had been parked in an automobile directly across the street from the Montgomery store. They had been able to give us a description of the car that the suspects had driven away from the scene, along with the last three numbers on the license plate. While Frank and I had been talking to Mrs. Montgomery, officers Benson and Herman from robbery detail had been going through the Department of Motor Vehicle Records looking for the owner's name. Information on the method of operation used in the crime was sent to the stats office and the run was started. The moniker file at R&I was checked for a suspect with a nickname Hank, who matched the description of the smaller thief. 
The two eyewitnesses were brought into the city hall to go through the mug books for a possible identification. While Frank went to the office to check with Benson and Herman, I worked with the witnesses. No. Uh-uh. No, this page. How about here? No, I don't see me here either. All right. Oh, wait a minute. This fellow here, see? This one? Yeah, it's not the hold-up man, but he's got the same kind of ears. Close to his head like... Yeah, same kind of ears. You sure it's not the man, though? Ah, uh-uh. he's got ears like him. All right, Mr. Steele, would you go on, please, here? Mm-hmm. I remember those years. I used to go to school with a kid that had ears like that. Junior high school. Yes, sir. He's a mean kid. I'll never forget him. He's real mean. I don't guess I thought of him for at least 15 years. I'll never forget him, though. Mean? Yes, sir. He waited for me after school once. I had a big fight. I don't even know what it was about. Big fight. He really beat me up. Yes, sir. Sure like to meet him now. It'll be a different story. Yes, sir. Now, how about right here? Do you see either of the suspects on these pages? No. No picture in this book. You got another one? Yeah, I got it. Say, how, how many more got of these things, anyhow? There's quite a few. You can see them right here on the shelf. You want me to go through all of them? Well, we'd like to have you check the pictures, yes, sir. That's going to take a while. You and your wife are the only two people who can give us an identification. Well, how about the woman who was held up? What's her name, Mrs. Holman? No, Montgomery. Holman was the officer who was shot. Yeah, yeah. What about Mrs. Montgomery? Can't she tell you about the robbers? She's under the care of her doctor. Her husband died, you know. What, from being stabbed? Yes, sir. That's right. That's too bad. We didn't know what it was all about, you know. Yes, sir. Me and Harry are just sitting there. All of a sudden, there's this fight and a shot. We didn't know what the freaks was. Yes, sir. Now, what if we can go on with the books here? Oh, yeah. Now, how about right here? No. No, not here. All right. Mm-hmm. Say, he's, he's mean. What'd he do? Robert. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell. Look at the face. You can always tell. Yes, sir. No, I, I, I don't see him here. Perry. Sir? Perry Nicholson. That's the guy's name. One of the close ears. I remember it now. I haven't thought anything. Fifteen years. Perry Nicholson. Bully. Yes, sir. Sure like to meet old Perry now. It'd be a different story if he wanted to fight now. Oh, different story. Yes, sir. Joe. Yeah. Hold up, car. Yeah. I just found it abandoned. <laughs> Two officers in the radio unit had found a car in a parking lot at the corner of Rosemont Avenue and Waterloo. When the vehicle was discovered and the similarity to the description that had been broadcast was noticed, the car was put under surveillance and our office had been notified. Frank and I left the city hall and drove out to the parking lot immediately. The car was placed under surveillance again and we checked it through DMV. We found the car was owned by an Edwin Vargas, 1879 Moss Street, out in Burbank. We checked the name through R&I, but we found that he had no criminal record in our file. We drove out to see Vargas. While Frank covered the rear of the place, I rang the bell of the house and waited. Yeah? I'd like to see Mr. Vargas? Well, he's not in right now. Anything I can do? You know where he is? No. I imagine he got held up downtown, probably working late. Where if we are if I wait for him? Well, I'm not sure. You mind telling me who you are? Sorry. Police officer. My name's Friday. What'd the cops want Ed for? It might be better if we talk to him. You alone? Anybody else in the house, ma'am? No. Your husband owned a 1953 dark blue Ford sedan? Yes. He's driving it tonight, is he? Well, sure. He took it to work with him this morning. All right. Might be better if I wait inside, huh? All right. Come on in. I don't know what this is all about, but you can bet it's some kind of mistake. Ed's never had no trouble with the cops. Never. None. Mm-hmm. Where's that door lead over here? Bedroom. All right. If I take a look? Well, go ahead. You ain't going to find anything. What's that over there? The bathroom? Yeah. One bedroom? No need for any more. Me and Ed don't have any children. Kitchen this way? Yeah. Say, if you're looking for something, maybe if you'll tell me what it is, I can help you. You just want to check the house, ma'am. Is this all the rest of the house? I told you we don't need any more room. Let me see. Just unlocking your back door, ma'am. My partner's out there. Hi, Frank. Is he here? No. No, Who is this, another cop? This is my partner, Frank Smith, Miss Vargas. Hello. Seems to me you should be able to tell me what this is all about, Mr. Friday. Can you give us a description of your husband? Why? It might help us to get him out of trouble, maybe. 
He's in no trouble. You got something on your back and you're trying to dump it on Ed and it isn't going to work. You want to give us a description? What do you want to know? How tall is your husband? Six three. How old? Thirty two. What color is his hair? Kind of sandy. Look, what is this? A third degree? What are you trying to prove with all these questions? I just want to get at the truth, ma'am. It's a kind of hard way to do it, if you ask me. Well, I'm sorry for causing you any trouble. You are. Where does your husband work? He's a salesman. Who for, ma'am? Insurance company downtown. Usually work this late? No, I told you that. But you think he's at work tonight? Yes. Well, then you wouldn't mind if we called him, would you? I'm not going to have you causing him any embarrassment. Well, don't worry about it, Miss Vargas. Would you like to give us the number? It's in the phone book. Look under emergency numbers. We'll make a call for him. Yeah. Look, what do you think he's done? Police business, ma'am. I'm his wife. I got a right to know. It'll be better if we talk to him, I think. And that's what you say. Your husband ever been in trouble with the police before? Not that I know of. How long you lived here? You mean in California? That's right. I was born here. How about your husband? He's been here a couple of years. Where's he from? New York State. Where in New York State? A little place right outside of Utica. You ever been in trouble back there, would you know? Well, if he was, he didn't say anything to me about it. How long has he had the job? Since a week after he came out. It's a smart guy. He'd have no trouble getting work. How about it? I talked to the building superintendent. Yeah. He says Vargas left at 5.30 this afternoon. The description of the owner of the car used in the holdup, coupled with his absence, made him a prime suspect in the robbery. We continued to talk to his wife. She gave us some of the background on Vargas. She told us that they'd only been married a little over a year, and that they were still trying to pay off the debts that her husband had incurred before their marriage. She went on to say that in the last few days, he'd been depressed about their finances, and that on that morning, Vargas had said he'd figured a way out for them. Frank called the office, and the broadcast was gotten out, asking if the man be picked up and detained for questioning. 1.15 a.m. We asked Mrs. Vargas about her husband's friends. Isn't anyone Ed's real close to? Well, is there one man he's with more than the others, would you know? Maybe somebody he works with. No. Unless maybe it's Vic. Ed don't have much to do with him, though. He knows I don't care for him. Don't like to have him around. Who's that, man? Vic Noble. He works in the same office as Ed. And what's he look like? Oh, not much. Little guy. Kind of nondescript. Never did figure out he could be a good salesman. I'd never buy anything from him. Honestly, he makes me nervous just to have him around. Yes, oh, excuse me. Yes, go right ahead. If it's your husband, it might be better if you didn't tell him we were here. All right. Hello? Yeah, honey, where you been? What? Well, do you know when? Uh-huh. Well, did you call the police? Well, you should have called him right away. Yeah. No, I'll drive right down and pick you up. You wait right there. Uh-huh. Well, right away. That's right. Well, look, tell me where it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Turn left, yeah. All right, I'll find it. You wait right there, will you? All right, goodbye. Bye. That was Ed. Yeah. You're going to have to find yourself another boy. Ma'am. Yeah. Well, whatever this is, it has something to do with Ed's car, doesn't it? That's right. And then you're all wrong about Ed. He couldn't have had anything to do with what it. What do you mean? Ed's car was stolen tonight. <laughs> We got the address of the bar where Ed Vargas had called from. Frank and I drove down and talked to him. He told us that he'd left work and stopped in the bar for a couple of drinks before he went home. However, when he left the place, he found that his car was gone. He returned to the bar and spent the next several hours trying to figure out what to do. We talked to the bartender and he verified Vargas' statement that he'd been in the place all evening. He was released from custody and allowed to return home. Frank and I continued to talk to the bartender. Got to get ready to close up pretty quick. Just a couple more questions. Would you mind if I clean up the back bar while we talk? No, sir. Go right ahead. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know? Well, you told us that Vargas came in about a quarter of six. Is that right? Near as I can remember, yeah. I give or take a couple of minutes on either side. But he was here before seven. For sure. You meet anybody here? How far is this going to go? Well, what do you mean? Is his wife going to find out if I tell you? Not from us. Well, Ed and the missus haven't been getting along so good lately. You know, been beefing a lot. Yeah. Ed's a funny guy. He don't like no trouble at home. As soon as Sarah started giving him problems, he found another girl, a kid that works at his office. They usually drop in here for a couple of drinks before he goes home. Yeah. Nothing serious going on with them, just they like to sit and talk. Ed's all the time telling her how this wife doesn't understand him. Old line, but I think he means it. He was in here with a girl tonight, was he? Yeah, just like all week. Every night, they come in about a quarter to five, sit in the back booth, have a couple of martinis, and then they leave. I think maybe Ed drops her off on the way home. She don't have a car. Yeah. Tonight, they had more than just a couple of drinks. I think maybe there was something wrong, you know, a little problem. What about? Look, people come in here to relax. They all got something on their minds. I make it a practice not to eavesdrop or interfere. What was their problem, do you know? Sarah won't hear it? No, we told you before. Yeah. 
Oh. One wanted to come around here causing no beef. She's jealous, you know, real jealous. That's so? Oh, yeah. Anyway, Ed must have told the girl that he was thinking of leaving his wife because tonight she told him to do something about her or she was walking out. Had a little kind of tiff and then she left. After that, he went out to get the car and found it been stolen. Where'd he leave it, do you know? A lot behind the building. Did he leave the keys in the car? I don't know. You saw him when he left, carrying a big load. He don't remember. Probably did, though. You have anybody else in here tonight that looked like Vargas? What do you mean? Well, as tall as he was, maybe. A lot of tall people come in here. Yes, we understand. But were there any tonight? A couple, yeah. Any of them come in with a short fellow, about five, six, or seven? Yeah. What time did they come in? Oh, about a little after seven. When did they leave? Well, I don't know. Maybe seven, thirty, quarter of eight. I'm not sure. There's one of the tables back there. I served them a couple of times. Didn't take much notice when they left. They paid for the drinks when I brought them. Left a half a buck tip. Took off. They come in here regular, do they? Yeah, a couple times a week, maybe more. They usually together? Oh, well, I've never seen them any other way except once. I'd rather not remember that time. What do you mean? Came in early, spent the whole night here boozing, got pretty plastered. I had to take Nick home. He couldn't make it alone. Which one is Nick? The short one, little guy. What's he do for a living? Nothing I ever heard of. Well, how does he live? Any way he can. Always seems to have dough. I think maybe some kind of gambler, something like that. Always loaded. The way he looks, though, you'd think he was some kind of mechanic, but he's not. All right. Sure, he dresses nice. Always got a good suit on, but he doesn't know how to carry it off. What do you mean? His fingernails. I don't think he ever cleans them. We got complete descriptions of the two men. They matched those of the thieves perfectly. The bartender closed the place and took us down the street to a hotel where he said he'd taken Nick Roxford. We talked to the desk clerk, but we found that Roxford had moved several months before. By checking with some of the people in the hotel, we got a forwarding address for him. It was a cheap rooming house down on South Pico. Frank and I went by the city hall and ran the name through R&I. We found that Roxford had an arrest record for petty theft in ADW. He'd served a term in the county jail and was at present under the jurisdiction of the court. His mugshot was pulled and taken out to the witnesses for identification. We checked with the manager of the boarding house, and we found that Roxford and a Henry Larson were registered in one of the rooms. In the company of the manager, we went up to the room, but the pair wasn't in. We contacted the office and told them where we were. They told us that Roxford had been positively identified as one of the hold-up men. We settled down to wait for the suspects to come back. 3.30 a.m. 4. 5. 5.15 a.m. Sounds like somebody's coming. Hmm. Well, there wasn't no other way. You was there, didn't see you doing nothing to stop it. You shot the cop. I still think so. All right, hold it right there. What are you doing here? Police officers, you're under arrest. Hold it, Frank. Too tight. No, you might hurt him, huh? Two suspects were taken downtown to the interrogation room. Henry Larson was handcuffed to the chair in robbery while Frank and I talked to Nick Roxford. It's a bad beef. I know it. You guys are going to find out. Why don't you tell us about it? Ain't going to tie no robbery wrapped to me. Look, we've already done it. The witnesses gave us a positive identification on you. How could they? They've never seen me. We got a picture of you. It's pretty good. You want to tell us about it? I got nothing to say. I want a lawyer. I ain't going to talk till I see a lawyer. All right. Yeah. Do you know the old man died? I don't know nothing about no old man. His wife says you're the one who stabbed him. She's crazy. She's willing to take it to court. It'll never stick. We think it will. We think we can make you for first degree. What about Hank? Who, Larson? Yeah, what happens to him? Same charge. He know it yet? Well, you're the first one to hear what if I give you a hand? How do you mean, man? Well, suppose I tell you it was Hank's idea, the whole thing. Go any better with me? You know, we don't decide that. Well, it seems like if I helped you, it'd be better with me. All right, you want to tell us about it? I'll make you a deal. No deals. Look, just promise me you won't tell Hank if I give you the real story, huh? All right, go ahead. Well, the whole thing was his idea right from the start. He cased the store. The whole thing was his idea. What about the car? Well, that was Hank's, too. He spotted it. Said it'd make a good deal. You check the car, you'll find his prints all over it. All right, what happened after that at the store? Oh, well, it was Hank again. I didn't want no part of it. Hank made me. Said if I backed out, he'd get me. He's a big man. He gets mean when he's crossed. I wasn't about to give him no trouble. 
Go ahead. Well, we got to the place, and he made me go in. He made me take a piece of the action. Now, wait a minute. Let's back up here and get this straight. You trying to tell me all the time you wanted no part of it? No. No, you, you got to believe it. Boy, we got it. You were having a time with a knife. Well, I got scared. That's all. I got scared. I didn't know what I was doing. Sure you did. Look, you got to believe me. I'm telling the truth. It was all Hank's idea. The whole thing. I want no part of it. Never did. All right. Just keep your voice Look, down, will you? I told you. Now, you know about the whole thing. You won't tell Hank, will you? What difference does it make? If he finds out I told you, he'll kill me. Remember I asked you before? Huh? What difference does it make? <laughs> Henry Taylor Larson and Nicholas John Roxford were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. On recommendation of the jury, they received maximum sentence and were executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Sunday at 8.30 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's transcribed story. She's lovely, she's engaged, she eats soybeans. This one revolved around the beauty, the kind that drives some men mad, some to murder. Her name, last week, was Miss Fireworks on the 4th, but she didn't have to worry about catching on fire. Everything was insured. But there was somebody that didn't like her in a bathing suit, and a big guy that shot skeet and never missed. But once... I got a call from my boss, the lion, last Wednesday morning before breakfast, said he had to see me right away. When I got down to the detective bureau, the lion was chewing slowly and holding a picture, Jeffrey, a photograph to be exact. Chewing your cut, lion? A wheat kernel, Jeffrey, sunny fruit of Mother Earth. I saved some for your breakfast. Where's the marmalade? You don't scoff, my boy. These golden grains are patented wheat. Who's got a patent on wheat? It's Steve Albright. And this isn't just any wheat. It's grown only in a sun-splashed acre of alluvial soil, watered by a gushing spring of... Uh, have a Colonel Jeffrey. Thanks. It's the new miracle health food, my boy. If you're fat, uh, heavy, it slims you. If you're lean, it fat, uh, builds you up. And you need only ten kernels a day. Here, have another. Uh, the picture, Fatso. Yes, the picture. Well, look what the wheat has done for this girl, Jeffrey. Uh, wrong side up. Yeah? Uh, oh, yes. yes. Ah, bathing beauty. <laughs> a professional, my boy. He travels around the country doing, uh, doing, uh... This. Yes. 
Here, but there's trouble afoot, Jeffrey. This lovely girl is in some sort of danger. What kind? That's your job, my boy. You must find out. Our retainer of $150 says you do. Who's Steve Albright? Uh, her manager. He, he left me these pictures of the girl, and when I asked how she managed to keep her figure... He produced uh, a sack of wheat and said, chew slowly. Uh, something like that. What's the girl's name? Uh, name? I, uh, I guess I uh, <laughs> forgot to ask. You're right. Doesn't make any matter. Where do I find the Steve Albright? Yeah, I have the address right here. Oh, you're improving. Uh, oh, here, here it is. Now, give me back my picture and get right out there. Mr. Albright said this girl is a very valuable property. Some photographs lie, but these told the truth. About soft hair flowing down to the waist. A fluted figure, tight in a two-piece bathing suit. If you look real close for it. Now, who'd want to... Get a girl like this in trouble. But somebody did. It was afternoon before I could contact Albright. His office was in a small white stucco building back of the Sunset Strip. No elevators. The directory said Steve Albright, Massive Enterprises Incorporated, Suite 3. I found it. The door said enter. I entered. Regan, excellent. The office was one room, a desk, and... Steve Albright is my name. Perfect. Glad you got here so soon. Excellent. Glad to know you. Wonderful. Uh, you're thinking this is a small office, that Massive Enterprises is broke. I ask you to examine the books, Mr. Regan. You've paid us. Uh, there's somewhere in this drawer. Is it? Oh, here they are. <laughs> Excellent. Where's the girl? Uh, we'll come to her, fine. Graham. Uh, the books, you see? I go back to 1948. That's when I found her. What do you call her? Uh, actual name, Jerry Shoulder. Marvelous. But no one knows her by that name. As you can see in the books, Mr. Regan, it's always something like uh, Miss Gold Coast. Mm-hmm. Let's see, Chicago, fourteen hundred thirty-six dollars fifty-six cents. Two days' work, pictures, endorsements, radio shots. Mm-hmm. Good money for two days' work. Jerry was Miss Coltar derivatives for the Duplan Manufacturing Empire. Twenty-seven hundred sixty-nine dollars and eighty-four cents. In three days, marvelous. Of course, the flower festivals and all have a bathing beauty contest, but they find it's much simpler and more advantageous to have a professional win. She knows how to pose. She knows what to say and do, and. <laughs> Oh, she's more beautiful. That uh, makes sense. You say she's in trouble. Eh, uh, we did very well in Kansas City as Miss Ground Round for the butchers. I want to know about now. Eh, uh, well, since we've been here, Mr. Regan, there have been innuendos. Threats against her life. Why? I don't know. Uh, well, here, you can see from a picture. You left pictures of her with Lion, I'm convinced. Uh, I mean, Mr. Regan, it's seldom that a girl comes along who has all... Delightful. Uh, I mean, it's insured. Insurance is a wonderful business. Yeah, $100,000 overall. And Lloyds of London will pay $10,000 if she injures those legs of hers. Mm -hmm. You want me to act as her bodyguard, eh? Precisely, Grand. Delightful. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, if you feel you can resist her. You see, Mr. Regan, her value as a professional bathing beauty is ruined if she gets mixed up with men. Marries. Uh -huh. You uh, got a policy on that, too? Mm -hmm. 50000 I promise I won't marry the girl. Your big job is to keep men away from her. What man? Uh, uh, His name? Uh, uh, Banyan. He is tall, good-looking. Yeah, I know him. Cheap rackets here. Oh, excellent. Then we can do business. Um, just curiosity, Albright, but uh, what about the golden grains of patented wheat? Oh, oh that's just a sideline of our enterprise, Mr. Regan. Women wonder how Jerry Shoulder managed to keep what you see in this photograph. So, we started a little health food business on the side. Yeah, another thing, uh, if something happens to Jerry's shoulder, who gets the insurance money? Massive Enterprises. Which is? Me. I checked the insurance policies. They seemed genuine. I asked where I could find Jerry's shoulder and was told the beauty parlor. Where else? And that's where I headed, only instead of a parlor, it was a beauty salon. The doors were plate glass, the doorman, an electric eye. The plate glass swung out. I swung in. I sank into the deep rug like it was something alive. The place was wired for music. There were flowers and a statue of Aphrodite, life-size, standing in the fountain. The official greeter was... Trey Chick in ascot tie and cutaway pants. Watch it to you, Mac. He said, noticing my glance. You maybe want your hair done. If you don't mind my asking, um, why are you working here? The slick dames got to get their kicks. I remind them of Humphrey Bogart. 
Oh, yeah, sure. Well, now, Humph, uh, could you tell me... My name is Mongo. Who was that? Just a dame getting beautiful. You was asking? I, uh, looking for a girl named Jerry Shoulder. All right, boys. Gang, in here. Mr. Banyan will want to talk to you. The big guy rammed his shoulder into my stomach, then grabbed my arm and twisted it behind my back. He opened a door and shoved me into a room. He locked the door from the outside. There was another door, and it was locked, too. I looked around the room. It was like a medieval torture chamber. Weird racks and iron maidens connected to steam pipes. Metal rollers and headless horses. All to change nature's idea of what a woman should look like. I tried the door again. This time it opened. Only someone was coming in. She was young. She was lovely. She wore a bathing suit. Tall, deeply tanned brunette. Moving easily toward me on calendar legs. You want to see me? There's more? I'm Jerry Shoulder. I thought maybe. I don't get to meet men. I'm... I'm sorry you caught me looking like this. Well, it's all right. You see, I just had my hair done and had to wrap it in a towel. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mungo tried to keep me out of here, but I persuaded him to let me come in. You wanted me for something? I'm your new bodyguard, lady. <laughs> He's starting that again. He doesn't huh? want you to get into trouble. Oh, you wouldn't let anything happen to me, would you, Mr. Uh... Regan? Mr. Regan, the lion's eye. Oh, I've heard of you. I've... I've heard you're very good. On some things. Well, you mustn't pay too much attention to my manager. Your manager Regan. says you've been threatened. Oh, there must be some mistake. I've never been threatened in my life. Oh, pardon me while I climb up on my horse. Huh? Oh. There. Yeah. No, don't leave, Mr. Regan. Stay right here. Hmm. Time for my exercise. Do you have any idea who might, uh... Want to do you bodily harm? I just love exercise, Mr. Regan. Yeah, sure. Could it be a man named Banyan? Mr. Regan, you've got to help me get out of this place. You, you man, come here. There was a woman standing in the doorway. There was a gun in her hand. I know how to use this. Get away from her. She motioned me toward the door. I obliged. Then we were in the hall. And I noticed the woman was holding the gun awkwardly. The safety was on. You men are all alike. Yeah, they tell me. Now, give me the gun. You stay away from Jerry. The gun. I'll just put it back in my purse, but you stay away from Jerry now. The woman dropped the gun into her purse. She wore a plain, hugging jersey dress. Gray hair in a bun at the back of her head. The kind of a woman you see in bars. Late. Alone. We've got to keep men away from Jerry. I'm sorry if I frightened you. Don't tell me you're a private eye. Yeah. I'm Martha, Jerry's wardrobe mistress. I keep her bathing suits in cool, dry places. They're latex, you know. Do you know a man named Albright? Sure, that's Jerry's manager. He's the one that told me to protect Jerry, keep the men away. Well, then why didn't you do it? The way she came walking in, anybody could have got to her. I was busy for a moment in the back, looking for a cool, dry place. Does Jerry know a small-time racketeer named Banyan? Well, if she does, I don't know about it. And I'm with her constantly. Yeah, like today. Oh, I'll bet you're Jeff Regan. Yeah, so Albright told you I was on the case. He huh? tells me everything, Mr. Regan. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe he can tell you why Jerry didn't follow us out into the hall. Hey, that seems We better take a look in that room. <laughs> Jerry's shoulder was gone. Out the other door. But we still had a catch. Standing in the middle of the 17th century chamber of mechanical horrors was a 20th century mess. The ape in ascot tie and pearl buttons only now his clothes were torn. His face scratched and bleeding. All right, where's the girl? I was only trying to Wake help. Wake up, will you? Where is Mr. she? Mr. Banyan, he Banyan said... Banyan again. Keep her safe from guys. He Snap said. out of it. Will you? I, I couldn't hit his girl. I tried to hold her. She hit me, scratched me. Is she still me. in the building? She even screamed at me, but I couldn't hit his girl. Banyan, sure. And I know where to find him. Banyan operated out of the Seven Club. But when I checked, he wasn't there. I finally caught up with him outside of town, in a spot hidden from the highway. A country club. A gambling joint that featured bare-knuckle bouts, cockfighting, and now, Banyan, with a shotgun in his hands, shooting skeet. Pull! 
dead duck. Nice shooting, Banyan. Talking to yourself, Banyan? Huh? Oh, Regan. Shooting plate pigeons a little out of your line, isn't it, Banyan? Plate pigeons? You never know which way they'll fly. Sharpens the eye. Pull. <laughs> yeah. Makes it easy when you're trying for a larger target. Nice spot you got here. Doesn't belong to me, if that's what you're after. No, no, no. The way I read it, brand new beauty parlor belongs to you. Likewise, a guy named Mungo. That's your new friend. Regan, it's a salon. Oh, yeah, I thought. What I'm after, Banyan, is a girl named Jerry Shoulder. Never heard of her. Beautiful, isn't she? Very. Look, I'm playing for keeps. Oh? Uh-huh. You won't mind if I just slip a few more shells into my shotgun. Just remember, I don't scare. Oh, I'd almost forgotten. Open up, Banyan. Jerry's shoulder. You know what my enemies are saying, Regan? That Jerry's shoulder's as good as dead. Pull! He missed. This time. I checked the club grounds. No Jerry's shoulder. She wasn't with Banyan. I headed back to L.A. Fast. It was late when I reached L.A. I had to get the lion. I phoned him at his apartment. Nobody home. I called again 15 minutes later. Still no answer. I was getting worried. I went to his apartment. He wasn't there. I checked with the janitor. He told me the lion was on the roof. That's where I found him. In bed. Lion. Hey, lion. Uh, 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 oh, oh, it's you, Jeffrey. Why is the boy scouting on the roof? Uh, I'm sleeping in nature's own clean, sweet air. My boy. Uh, move my cot up here just this evening. Look, lion. You're sleeping uh, under the stars just as Mother Nature intended. Lion, If I'm... Mr. Albright says my shoulder sleeps out even when it's raw, it's part of the health plan. Uh, uh, look at me, Jeffrey. I'm thinner already. You know, I've only had eight kernels of the patented wheat today instead of ten. <laughs> I did without dessert. Listen, fatso, I'm heading for Jerry Shoulder's hotel. I want you to check on Banyan. Is that low criminal? Find out where he's been the last few days, how he's been spending his time, everything. Keep an eye Oh, oh, all right, Jeffrey, if you insist. I insist. Uh, do you think you'll find me shoulder at a hotel? Maybe. If she's alive. I dropped the lion off at police headquarters to get a rundown on Banyan. Then I drove to Jerry Shoulder's apartment hotel. The street was quiet and deserted. Most of the windows were black, just a few lights here and there. Patio balconies. Very swank. Inside, there was a self-help elevator. I went up. The elevator opened onto a long corridor. A small night light down at the end. The room was 306. I was almost at the door when... The door banged open and coming at me fast was that mug from the beauty parlor. Mungo! Get out of my way! No, brother, not this time! It's like... My fist pounded his stomach as soft as pie. He doubled and fell. I jumped over him and ran into the apartment. The lights were on. The living room was empty. I tried the bedroom. The light was on in there, too, glaring white on what I didn't want to see. There was a body lying across the bed. Not Jerry's shoulder. A man's body. A bullet through his chest. The dead man was Steve Albright. The ripped sheet that covered him was stained. Purple. This is CBS, and you are listening to tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator, entitled, She's Lovely, She's Engaged, She Eats Soybeans. Steve Albright was dead in Jerry Shoulder's apartment, a bullet hole in his chest, and what looked like purple acid burns through the bedclothes. I'd caught Mungo, the well-dressed ape from the beauty parlor, coming out of the apartment door, and I knew that Mungo worked for Banyan, the racketeer. Albright had hired me as Jerry Shoulder's bodyguard. <laughs> He'd have done better to have hired me as his. I called candidate homicide. Now, the police photographers were gone. We were waiting for the coroner. Candid sitting on the bed next to Albright's body. Candid was eating Fig Newtons. Well, I'm glad you held on to Mungo, Regan. You think he did it, Candid? Open and shut case. 
You know, uh, Jerry's shoulder was insured, but plenty. Yeah, you said. I called the night member of the insurance company right after I called you, Candid. They said all her policies were in effect but one. You know which one? I'm not interested, Regan. I've got the killer. It was the one that would have paid off to Albright. The deceased. If Jerry had married. Hmm. That policy lapsed a month ago. Well, my insurance is always lapsing. Now, well, this one lapsed because Albright married Jerry's shoulder himself. What? The company wouldn't pay on that. And Albright couldn't let it out because there's no such thing as a married bathing beauty. So Mungo was nuts about the dame. She gives him the come on. He finds out about her being married, comes up here and... And? Have a fig Newton, Regan. A real fresh. And? Well, he's going to kill the girl like they all do, Regan. You know that. But Mungo gets real mad when he finds her husband in her bed, and he knocks him off. Mungo denies it. They all do, Regan. You know, Cannon, the way the bullet entered, looks like it was a hurry-up job. So Mungo was nervous. You know Mungo worked for Banyan. We've got the killer. Yeah. Mind if I, uh, turn out these lights? Hey, now, wait a... Regan, I can't see. Yeah, it's kind of dark in here. Regan, where are you? I feel something moving. There's a dead guy in here, Regan. Give your eyes a chance to get used to the dark. Oh, gee, turn the light on. Huh? Barely make out the figure on the bed. In the name of the law, Regan. <laughs> okay, Candid. I've got all I need here. I left Candid and the dead man and headed for my car. But I saw something across the street that stopped me. A long black convertible with a top up. Over the wheel, I could see a face. Banging. I ran across the street, grabbed the door handle just as the car started to move. Opened it and pulled the handbrake. Take it easy, Riggin. You're liable to get hurt. Are you waiting for someone, Banyan? What I do is my business. Been up to Jerry's apartment tonight, Banyan? Cops having a ball over there, Regan? Yeah, a real party. They're serving refreshments. Big Newtons. I stopped laughing in 29. Maybe you've been in the building. Just got out. You were leaving without saying goodbye. Where's Jerry's shoulder, Regan? Let's look in your car trunk. If anything happened to that girl, I'm holding you responsible. Put that gun away. She's the only clean, decent thing I've ever had in my life. Something a people like you wouldn't understand. Try me. Jerry Shoulder and I are engaged to be married. You'll have to stand in line. Yeah? Putting the racket. Sure, at first I was just playing around with Jerry, but then I found she was... Different. A decent dame. You've known Jerry Shoulder how long, Banyan? Three weeks? Ever since she's been in town. Yeah, maybe three weeks. How'd you meet her? I answered a lonely heart, Sad. Look, Manion, I know you started that beauty shop front so you could meet Jerry there. Or have her brought there so you could be nearer. Oh, let's stop fishing. Sorry, time's running out, Banyan. I gotta give it to you straight. Jerry's shoulder was married to Steve Albright. What? Why, you lying. Somebody's been killed in Jerry's shoulder's bed, and it looks like it might be a hubby. Maybe you better go take a look. Banyan ran upstairs, but I didn't have time to wait for his reaction. I had an appointment at Massive Enterprises. It was four in the morning now. A clear sky pouring cold moonlight down on the deserted stucco that housed Massive Enterprises Incorporated. The outside door was open. Steve Albright's office was locked. It opened on the third key I tried. I snapped the overhead light on. Everything just as I remembered it. I opened the desk and found what I wanted. When Steve Albright had said that Massive Enterprises consisted of himself, he was almost right. The health food sideline was in the name of Martha Highgate. I used the phone to raise the line. Tried every place I thought he might be. Then tried the office of the detective bureau. Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. Anthony J. Lyon. Me, Fatso. Oh, Jeffrey, my boy. I've been trying to locate you. What'd you get on Banyan? Yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. I picked up his trail at the Seven Club. He was with Jerry's shoulder. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I just talked to Banyan. Yeah, I'm not surprised, Jeffrey. I took his girl away from him. Jerry's shoulder? Yes, when they came out of the club, Banyan went to get his car. I spoke to Miss Shoulder and told her she was in great danger. Showed my credentials and she came with me. With you? Yes. Oh, she's a very nice girl, my boy. She said she's had to go around with Banyan. He practically forced her to accompany him. Where's Jerry's shoulder now? Well, she was here at the office up until an hour ago. We had a midnight bite of wheat and quite a nice chat. She's gone? Well, I was out getting a drink of water, and when I came back, she was gone. Anything else on Banyan? Oh, yes. There is no Banyan. 
Come again? If Banyan is just one of the aliases taken by a hoodlum whose real name is Highgate. Highgate? And he has an older sister named Martha. He is, but how... That's all I needed. Thanks, Lion. It began to make sense. When Banyan saw Jerry's shoulder had run out on him, he phoned downtown to Mungo, had Mungo check her apartment. That's where I found him. I looked through Albright's desk and found Martha Highgate's address. It was the Rondo Hotel. When I got there, the room clerk was smiling. Room 405, where he can put you on find Martha Highgate up there. Who will I find? Smooth day. Must be a friend. Had a bottle and some ice cubes sent up just a little while ago. Celebrating. Celebrating? Wearing a bathing suit. I went upstairs and knocked on the door. I waited. Then I felt the knob turn in my hand. The door opened. And there, in a tight-fitting bathing suit, stood... Ah, oh, come in, Mr. Regan. Hey, wait a minute. You're not Jerry Shoulder. Come in, Mr. Regan. The room was dim in pink light. There was a rosy globe hanging down from the ceiling. A phonograph was playing. And the woman was the bathing duties wardrobe mistress, Martha Highgate. Drink, Mr. Regan. No, thanks, lady. Oh, don't you like me? Just a little. I'll like you more after we talk. Do you like me in this light? See, I uh, <clears throat> kept my figure young, Mr. Regan. You can't cheat Father Time with a pink light, lady. My hair looks almost black, if you don't stand too close. It's long, Mr. Regan. You even had the bellboy fooled with that bathing suit and your hair down, Mother. I'm Jerry's shoulder now. It'll take more than wishing to give you what she has, lady. Maybe a little drink will improve your eyesight. No one's eyesight's too good in a darkened bedroom, Martha. Bedroom? You loved Steve Albright, didn't you, Martha? Love Steve? Oh, sure, and he loves me. Yeah, he did all right by you, too. Made you part of massive enterprises, gave you a cut of the profits. But that wasn't enough. You wanted him. Uh-uh. I've got him. Oh, no, lady. Somebody's got him now, but not you. <laughs> not Jerry's shoulder. Steve Albright is dead. Dead? One thing, lady, you didn't know that Steve and Jerry were married. Steve and Jerry? Yeah, you should have turned that bedroom light on before you threw that acid. What do you mean? Jerry was on a date tonight with your brother. No. You killed Steve Albright, her husband. Steve. You made certain with a gun. But you couldn't stand the thought of Jerry's shoulder looking beautiful even in death. So you used acid, too. I can use this gun again, Mr. Reed. Oh, no, you won't use it again, Martha. You're a one-time gal. You won't kill again. Don't try me. Give me that gun, Martha. Stand back. Give it to me. All right. The muzzle blast was hot on my face. But Martha was still a poor hand with a gun. The bullet went wild and I had her by the arms. Tight. Get your hands off her, Regan. Banyan. Oh, honey, I knew you'd come. I knew you wouldn't let me take him. All right, give me the gun, Regan. One inside your coat, too. That's right. You won't get away with this, Banyan. What's Regan doing here, sis? Shoot him. Kill him, honey. What's Regan doing in your room? Well, he was going to take me in for killing Steve Albright. But now you won't let him. <laughs> you won't let him, will you, honey? Why the bathing suit? She went up there to kill Jerry's shoulder, Banyan. Why the bathing suit? I'm as beautiful as she is. Jealousy, Banyan. Your sister wanted Steve, but he fell for Jerry. How about it, sis? I wish now they'd been together tonight. I didn't know they were married. I'd have killed both of them. That's why I threw Jerry at you, honey. You wanted her, and I wanted to get rid of her. Oh, gee, I, I'm glad you showed up, honey. Now, come on, kill Regan. Come on, shoot Regan. No. That's not the way it's going to be. All right, Regan, here's your gun. What? The... Thanks, Banyan. What are you doing? You, you, you're my brother. You can't do that. You can't turn me You don't need to worry about Martha, Regan. No, I can't. So Jerry was married. Well, all that's over for me. But you tried to kill her, Martha. So I'm turning you in myself. No, no you can't. It'll hurt me. You're my brother. Yes, the woman in the bathing brother. suit, flattered yes, with a rosy light, you know, allowed her brother to take her by the arm and lead her from the room. Banyan delivered his sister to Candid down at Homicide. But to make sure, I followed Banyan's car all the way. Too bad about Banyan. Jerry was the only good thing that ever happened to him in his life. But it happened too late. Anyway, Candid finally found the scared Jerry shoulder, released Banyan's sidekick, Mungo, and that put a period in. It was ten in the morning when I checked in at the office. The lion was singing. There was a boy, a very strange enchanted oh, boy. Oh, nature boy. Oh, Jeffrey. 
Still not packing away the wheat, that's all? Oh, yes. Notice how much weight I've lost already, my boy. You know, this morning I saw my cheekbones for the first time in years. Oh, eyes sunken, color gray. Jeffrey, I've never felt so healthy. Yeah, I've been eating nothing but golden grains of patented weed. Patented. Yeah, patented. Oh. You know, Miss Shoulder eats nothing but health foods, Jeffrey. Last night she recommended a health food restaurant where we might have lunch. The Grated Garbanzo Grotto. Fine, fine. Yeah, it serves nothing but the finest dried soybeans. Good. Uh, yes. Raw cabbage. Delicious. Uh, delicious. Uh, choice beach bark. Yummy. Yummy. Yeah, I knew you weren't touching any other kind of food. No oh, health food, Jeffrey. Nature's boon to mankind. That's why I turned down the invitation for uh, you. Morted mango invitation? What invitation? Of course, uh, I'm going. Uh, you're going where? Candid's barbecue out at his place. You were invited, but uh, I knew you wouldn't be interested. Yeah. Uh. Barbecue. No, you wouldn't want hot buttered corn. Yeah, of course. Rich Caesar salad. Yeah, salad. Mounds of golden brown French fried potatoes. Oh. Steaks four inches thick. <laughs> Come on, Ryan. Jeffrey, wait for me. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and Gilbert Thomas, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Aron. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking, reminding you that Jeff Regan will be back next week transcribed. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Angeles. We were working the day watch on a narcotics detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Shy. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 10.23 a.m. when we got to room 42. Homicide. That's right. Mm-hmm. You got a name on Yeah. Hi, Joe. Frank. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. You're right. With you. Yeah? What's the spelling on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll check it out. All right? I'll call you back. Bye. Jack, how's it going? Pretty good. With you? Well, it doesn't do much good to kick. Yeah, it never worked for me. What do you got for it? Now, wait a minute, I'll get the pictures. All right. We got it late Saturday night. I just got the results of the autopsy this morning. Thought maybe you and Frank would be interested. Yeah, yeah, let me clear the table. What is it? Oh, here. The way we got the story goes together like this. A couple of kids on their way home from a late show walked through MacArthur Park. Must have been about 10.30. Yeah. Stopped at the side of the lake for a minute, and they saw something in the water. Went down to check it and found the body of a man. Yeah. Here's a picture of where we found him. Mm-hmm. Contacted the park authorities, and they called the police. Felony car answered, and they called us. Mm-hmm. You know who he is? No ID on him. Made him through his prints. Yeah. Name's Walter Gilmer. Appears to be his true name. Got several aliases. How about his background? Been picked up for just about everything in the code. Copy of his arrest record. Thanks. Your first arrest when he was 14. Yeah. Piling him up ever since. He added up, he spent over half his life in prison. Mm-hmm. Wait, looks he died someplace else. 
Thought he figured that, Jack. Oh, here. That's a picture taken of the path leading to the lake. Yeah. See here, the tracks? Mm-hmm. Looks like he was dragged down the gravel path and then dropped into the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See there, Joe? Yeah. What killed him? Yeah, had us for a while. No evidence of violence that could have done it. In his record, there are half a dozen people in town who'd like to take care of it. Yeah. A copy of the autopsy report. Mm-hmm. That'll explain why we thought you might want a piece of it. Yeah. He died of narcotics poisoning. dead man's effects without coming up with any additional information. From the report of the coroner's office, we knew that Gilmer had died of narcotics poisoning. We were not able to tell the type of the narcotics used, but it was listed as either heroin or morphine. During the past three months, the Southland had been flooded with an inferior grade of heroin. From chemical analysis, we knew that it was being processed in Mexico. We'd been in touch with Mexican authorities, but in spite of our joint activity, the drug continued to cross the border and it continued to be circulated. Arrests of mules and pushers had been made. Suspects had been interrogated, and all other leads had been checked out, but we were still unable to come up with the key people in the operation. The death of Walter Gilmer gave us a possible lead. We couldn't be sure that he died of the low-grade drug, but it was worth looking into. Working with Sergeants Jack McCready and Danny Galindo of Homicide Detail, we pulled Gilmer's package, and we went over all of the available information on him. We made out a list of his known friends and his associates. All of the places he was known to frequent were checked. For the next two days, anyone who had been seen in Gilmer's company was talked to. Apparently, we were at a dead end. Thursday, July 12, 11.14 a.m., Frank and I got back from talking to an informant. There was a note in the book to call McCready. McCready there? Yeah. Oh, Jack, Joe Friday. Mm-hmm. Well, where is he now? No, we'll be right over. Thank you. What's he got? One of Gilmer's friends. Yeah? Says he was with Gilmer when he died. Frank and I left the central police station and walked over to the city hall. By the time we'd gotten there, McCready had pulled the suspect's package and had what background information there was on the man. The three of us talked to him in the interrogation room. For the record, what's your name? David Flack. How old are you? Twenty-six. Is still your address? Yeah. How well did you know this Walter Gilmer? We roomed together. How long? A couple of years. According to your package here, you've had several arrests for being a user, is that right? He got the paper. Told us you were with Gilmer when he died. Now, look, there you go again. What? I said I was with him when he was sick, that's all. We got together Saturday night, had dinner, and Walt didn't feel so good. He shoved off, said he was going home and get some rest. It's the last time I saw him. He went home to get some rest. Go ahead. With what? There ain't no more to say. You guys asked me, remember? We talked to the manager of your apartment house. Real goof, ain't she? She says you and Gilmer came in together Saturday night, puts the time about 8.30. Because the two of you stayed there until about 9.30. Then she heard you come out of the elevator with Gilmer. She's got real big ears. That's what she says. Goes on to tell us that she went to the door of her apartment, looked out into the hall. Says she saw you carry Gilmer out of the apartment building. I carried Walt out? That's what she says. You know how big Walt is? You got an idea. Well, you know, I couldn't carry him any place. God weighs me about 50 pounds. I ain't that strong. The landlady's willing to testify to it. Yeah, she talks a lot. She's going to talk you right into the joint. We find Gilmer an hour later dead. You're the last person seen with him. Fit you real good, Flack. From here, it looks like you're right for a 187 charge. You figure you can nail me down for murder, huh? It's worth a try. Yeah, but can you make it go? We think so. Now, one thing's going to loss it up. Yeah? I didn't do it. I had no part in it. None. You better tell us then, huh? If I give it to you, it'll make a difference? Depends on the words. Go ahead. Where do I start? The beginning will do. Yeah. I guess Saturday afternoon's as good as any. We'll listen. Oh, well, Walt got himself a new connection. Said it was a good one. For heroin? Yeah. Got a good bar and a couple of bindles. Said it was a real good deal. You know where? No, he wouldn't tell me. He just said it was his, and that when I needed some stuff, he'd set it up for me. You're on H2, huh? Yeah, why well, lie to you? A couple of days in the tank will bring it out anyway. Yeah, I'm swinging a pretty good habit. How much? Shooting three a day. All right, go ahead. Oh, Walt had a fix about four in the afternoon. We were going off for dinner, and Walt said he had enough H so he could take one for free. Mm-hmm. After that, we went out and got something to eat. Walt didn't eat much, said he felt way out, didn't hardly eat at all. Yeah. Went back to the apartment, sat around, talked. I tried to get him to tell me where he made the connection. He just laughed and said it was the best thing he ever fell into. Didn't he give you any idea? No, not a smell. All right. Well, pretty soon he said he didn't feel so good. I thought maybe he needed another pop. I asked him if he wanted me to cook it for him. He said no. He said he just wanted to get some air. He told me he couldn't breathe too good. Just lay there on the bed grabbing for air. Mm-hmm. I asked him if he wanted me to call a doctor, get somebody up there to fix him. He looked pretty bad. Yeah. He told me he didn't want anybody just to leave him alone. Mm-hmm. About an hour later, I checked with him. I wanted to see if he felt any better. He was dead. 
You took him out of the apartment then? Yeah, I, I got scared. I didn't know what had happened, but I could see you guys landed on me. What'd you do? Took him out to the park, got him in the back seat of the car, and took him out there. Sat in the car for about 15 minutes waiting for a couple of kids to leave. I was sitting on the bench near there talking. I had to wait for them to leave. Yeah. After they'd gone, I dragged Walt down the water and dumped him in the lake. What about his identification? Took it out of his pocket. Figured he'd give me a couple of days to try and grow an alibi. Figured it'd take that long for you to find out who he was. You just left him in the lake then, huh? Yeah. Drove back to the house and tried to figure what to do. Think of somebody who'd go me an alibi. You haven't got any idea where Gilmer made the connection, huh? No. You know where he went Saturday afternoon? No, he left the place about 10 in the morning. I didn't see him until about 3 or maybe 3.30. He was holding pretty good then, real happy, laughing it up all over the place. Oh, Walt, he had a real good laugh when he was feeling good. Gee, I still can't get it straight that he's dead. Do you ever have any close friends that you know of? A couple, not more than that. Want to give us their names? I guess, as long as they don't find out. Did he meet any new people he told you about? If he did, he didn't say nothing. I'm sorry, I'd sure like to help you. It's a lousy trick making Walt think he was getting such a good deal and having it turn out like this. It's a lousy deal. Mm -hmm. He was real happy because he thought he scored real big, got it real cheap. Told me he hardly paid anything for it. Well, he had it wrong, didn't he? Huh? He was overcharged. We continued to talk to David Flack. From him, we got additional names of people Walter Gilmer had dealings with. We also got the addresses of bars and restaurants the dead man was known to have frequented. In our interrogation of Flack, he was unable to give us any lead as to where Gilmer might have bought the lethal narcotics. Thursday afternoon at 4.21 p.m., Flack was taken to the main jail to be booked in on suspicion of violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony. Frank and I went back to the office and talked with Captain Shy. We told him what had happened, and we reviewed the progress we'd made in attempting to apprehend the leaders of the narcotic ring. After talking over all the possibilities, it was decided that the only way we had of getting to the higher-ups in the operation was for one of us to go underground. It was decided that I would act the part of a buyer from Northern California and try to make the contact with the members of the ring. I was given a quantity of marked bills and fictitious identification before I left the office. Frank and I worked out a method for communication, and I went home to change my clothes. I left all of my police identification there, and the next morning I began to be seen in the bars and restaurants where Walter Gilmer was known. For the first week, it went slow. The people involved were cautious of all newcomers. On Saturday, July 21st, I had breakfast, and then I walked over to a small place on East 7th Street. Now, open for business yet, Joe? No problem. We had some time to kill well, I'd do it here if you got no beef. No, sit down. Just getting the booze up from downstairs. Hey, you want something, a Coke, maybe? Yeah. You got one that's cold? Yeah. I could uh, put a shot in it if you want. No, it's all right. It's too early. Boss don't like it if I pour it before 10. Mm-hmm. How's business? Oh, not bad. Guess it's a little slow all over. Yeah. Now, what's going with you, Joe? Slow. How long you figure to be in town? i only got a couple more days. Mm-hmm. i got to get back up north. Never heard you say what you did. I told you I'm a promoter. You mean like price fights? No, anything I can make a buck on. What are you working on now? Well, i got a deal. Yeah, I guess you'd rather I didn't get too nosy, huh? Yeah, it might be better that way. Mm-hmm. Words out, you're trying to make a buy. What's that? I say, words out, you're trying to make a buy. That's so? Yeah, that's what the word is. Where's it from? Around. No place you can point to, just around. Anything on what I'm looking for? I uh, understand it's H. Is that what you think? I don't know. Just tell me what the word is. Uh-huh. I understand you're a good friend of Walt Gilmer. Yeah, I know him. We didn't live together. I knew him. Mm, rough thing about Walt. Yeah, yes it is. Did you ever find out what killed him? I don't know. I don't read the papers much. Was it in the paper? Yeah. Uh... Rumble is he got some bad stuff. Is that right? Yeah, that's what you're saying. There might be. I told you. I don't know. Well, I guess if you're a friend of his, you'd um, like to talk to his connection, huh? Well, it doesn't make any difference to me one way or the other. Mm-hmm. You ain't sore about Walt, then, huh? I told you. I knew him. I didn't know him good. Just enough to say hello. That's all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, rough the way he went. You call it your way. Well... I'll see you around, Al. Hey, you got to leave, huh? Told you. I only got a couple more days in town. I got to line something up before I go back. Well, uh, uh, maybe I can give you a hand. Yeah. Depends on what you're after. I got a lot of friends around. I might be able to do you some good. Well, how are you going to work that? Well, how much you want to buy? Let's see. Come off it, Joe. We got the rumble on you. You're down here from Sacramento. You're here to make a buy. It's a simple question. How much you want to take back with you? If 
if I wanted to make a connection. Uh, are you the guy I'm supposed to see? If I wanted to make a connection. Might work out that way. You holding now? A little. How big? Enough to handle your action. I want a couple of ounces. That's a lot of stuff. I don't sell cut rates. Now, are you holding that much or aren't you? Uh-huh. No, I can line it up for you. Where do you take your piece? Off the top. I make the deal for you. Oh, no. No go. Huh? I don't know how you work things here, but I only do business with a gun. Yeah, well, this one don't work that way. Well, then let's forget the whole thing. Hey, wait a minute. Hold, hold, hold it, Joe. Yeah. You got the cash? I can get it. Maybe it'll work. I'll have to see. I deal with a gun or the buy's off? I'll check it. Is it good stuff? The best we got to offer. That's not much of an answer, is it? It's good. It's when will you know? When will you know? Well, we'll wait here. I'll make a phone call. All right. This is Al. Yeah, I know, I know, but this is important. Got a guy here who wants to buy a couple of shirts. Now, large size. Uh-huh. As far as we know, he is. I, I talked to you about him. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. No, he says he won't buy them from anybody else. Yeah, that's what I told him. He, he says he's got it. Uh, just a minute, I'll check. Uh, he'll be here about 7 tonight. Huh? You be here tonight about seven? Well, we can make the deal, sure. Yeah, yeah, he can make it. All right. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I told you we checked. He's all right. Uh huh. Yeah, right. Goodbye. Deal's made. All right. Be here at seven. Make it sharp, huh? Okay. You meet the boss. I got in touch with Frank, and I filled him in on what had happened. For the first time in several months, it appeared as if we had a concrete lead to the operators of the dope ring. It was arranged to keep the bar under surveillance, but not to take anybody into custody until a buy had been made. I went back to the room I was renting, and I waited. I left at 5.30, had something to eat, and at five minutes to seven, I walked into the bar. The place was crowded. There wasn't an empty stool, and most of the booths were taken. I edged up to the bar and caught the bartender's attention. Hi, you John, you're early. No, you said seven sharp. Yeah. We're going to do business? Uh, where will I get out from behind the bar? Yeah. Back here, John. Yeah, here it is. You're joking, aren't you? No, Joe, this is the boss. Well, I had it figured a little different. Yeah, everybody does. Sitting in the booth was in her late 30s or early 40s. It was hard to tell. She had dark hair and blue eyes. The suit she was wearing was gray and it looked expensive. After the bartender introduced us, she told him to bring a drink and then she motioned me to sit down. Your name's Joe Frizee, is that right? Yeah. Al tells me he wants some action. No, he gave you the story. How do I know? You're a legitimate dealer. You don't. Joe, you want me to go out on a limb and turn over two ounces of heroin to you? I'm willing to pay for it, lady. Where's it going to go? Up north. On the ground. Slack them up. You got the route to get rid of it? They're waiting for it now. Go in and I should tell you I haven't got two ounces. Well, and I'm wasting my time. But I can get it. How soon? Sit down. Mm-hmm. How quick do you need it? I want to leave town in a couple of days. I told Al. You working alone? I don't see how that figures in the front. You're wrong. What? Case we've got goes for four fifty an ounce. It's pretty high. The best we can get? Should be. You want to make a deal, the price comes down. No, I can't swing more than two ounces. Even if the price is dropped? How much? To three fifty. No, it doesn't fit. What's the angle? If you're on your own, you must get a little tiresome to have to carry the load by yourself. Maybe. I was thinking maybe you'd like a partner. You? That's what I had in mind. No go. Why? Oh, a lot of reasons. Mainly because I don't need anybody. Then it's going to cost you four fifty. Well, I figured that going in. When do you want the stuff? Tomorrow night will do. Well, you have to be late. We got it coming in then. From where? The price doesn't include that. Okay. Where do I pick the H up? Alf will call you. He'll give you the time and the place. Well, if it's high grade, I might want some more. If you can pay our price, you'll get it. It's all right. You're making a big mistake, Joe. Is that so? Yeah. I got L.A. sewed up good and tight. Good distribution. All the product I need. You got the north. We put them together. We could both come out real well. No, I told you before. I don't need partners. 
You might be wrong, Joe. What? You might already have one. I stopped by the bar and gave the bartender my phone number. He said he'd call me as soon as he had any information. I left the place and walked over to Fifth Street. At a corner restaurant, I put in a call to Frank and I filled him in on what had happened. It was set up that he and Sergeant Roxy Lucarelli would keep me under surveillance all the following day. In the meantime, the woman, Dolores Page, would be watched also. I went back to the hotel where I was staying and went to bed. At 3.30 a.m., the phone rang and the bartender, Alf, told me to get dressed and meet him in front of the hotel right away. He said we were leaving town immediately to make the narcotics fly. I tried to call Frank and fill him in on what had happened, but I couldn't reach him. I got in touch with the office and left word regarding the meet and then went downstairs to wait for Alf. At 3.45 a.m., Alf drove up to the entrance. I tried to stall as long as possible to give the men from the office time to get there, but finally we left the hotel before they arrived. In the car with Alf and myself were a man who introduced himself as Earl and the woman, Dolores Page. We drove down to the beach and turned south on Highway 101. We continued down to San Diego. At 6.30 a.m., we checked into a small hotel, and Alf, along with Earl, left to make the meet and the buy. I tried to find out where they were going, but they refused to give me any information. Dolores Page and I waited for him to come back. I was unable to contact the San Diego authorities, telling them what to watch out for. Apparently, I'd lost contact with Frank and Lucarelli. The only hope now was that someplace along the line, the page woman and her associates would make some kind of a mistake. We waited at the hotel until 12.15 when Alf and Earl returned. Where's Earl? Downstairs in the car. How come you're so late? He got hung up on the other side of National City. Customs inspection. He went through the car. Find anything? No, but there's something wrong about the whole deal. What do you mean? Looked like they were waiting for us. Like somebody had tipped them off we were coming through. What makes you think that? The way they acted. Other cars had just looked over. Ours, they went all the way through. Took the seats out, checked the tires, even climbed underneath. Tell you somebody tipped him off. They were waiting. Anything wrong with this? I want no part of it. You understand that? We've been working it a long time without no hitch. All of a sudden, you come along, we got trouble. What are you trying to build? Just that it's funny it had happened now, first time you're here. Are you trying to say that I got something to do with the shakedown? If it fits, wear it. Now, you listen, you two-bit punk. I got more to lose than you have. I'm paying top price for this product. I got customers waiting now. You come breezing in here and try to lay one of your own mistakes on me, and I'll break your back. You talk like a man 12 feet tall. I don't have to be that big. All right, you. knock it off. You two beefing isn't going to do any good. They didn't find anything. You got no call to figure it was a tip, Alf. No reason at all. Now, let's get out of here. Tell your boy to get off my back. Please. Don't worry about it. There won't be any more trouble. Better not be. But I'll spell it out for you. Is that right? There is, and I'm going to cause it. The three of us went downstairs and got into the car. We started to drive back to Los Angeles. From what I could find out, the narcotics buy had been made in Mexico, but the heroin was not in the car we were driving. We continued up the coast. Just south of Oceanside, California, we began to follow a large bus. As we drove, I noticed that Alf was being careful to keep the vehicle in sight. At San Clemente, the bus pulled into a small roadside restaurant for a rest stop. We parked immediately in back of it. Alf got out of the car and approached the bus. He walked up to the rear of the vehicle, reached under the rear bumper, and removed a small package wrapped in waterproof material. He checked the contents, and then he walked back to the car. Get it? Yeah, right where we put the stuff. Get in. Let me have it. Yeah. There it is, Joe. Got the money? You want to wrap it up right here? No reason not to. Why don't we wait till we get back to town? be easier there. You got any special reason to wait? No. Got the money? Yep. Then why wait? Well, let me see what I'm buying. Here. Well, it looks all right. The best we can buy. You don't have to taste it. What are you trying to pull? What? What are you trying to sell me? This stuff's no good. You're not going to stick me four fifty for this junk. You made the deal. And I'm leaving it. I want no part of it. It's a little late to come up with that. You haven't been paid yet. We will be. Get out of the car. Leave him alone, Alf. We've done it your way all along. It hasn't worked out from here, and I'm going to call it. You're doing it wrong, Alf. You let me worry about that. Get out, mister. Go on. Well, where to? Let's take a walk around the back of the buildings. Go ahead. Figure to kill me and come up with the money, too. Is that it? Keep walking. You know you're not going to get away with it, don't you? You keep buying those fairy tales. Maybe we can make a deal, Alf. Yeah? If you get the money, it doesn't make any difference about me, does it? What do you mean? Now, wait a minute. Suppose I give you the money. You got it clean. You don't have to roust me then, do you? Maybe I like shoving you around. I never did figure you on our side. Why? Because you knew Walt Gilman. What happened to him doesn't make any difference to me. It don't read good, Joe. Right from the beginning, I didn't figure you. 
What do you mean? You set the deal up, didn't you? Looked like some fast change. I didn't count on this much McGill. It's not worth it. All this talk about Walt. What's he got to do with it? He was working with us, pushing. Got two wise. Thought he could do it without us. So you gave him a connection with Bad H, is that it? That's it. You kill me and Dolores isn't going to like it. You know that, don't you? The wheel just passed out of her hands. Come on, let's get it over with. All right. Where to? Back there. behind you since you left Dago. Yeah? How'd you work that? Well, I got the message you left at the office. We had a tail on the page woman. Picked you up down south. How about her and that other fellow back there? Roxy's got him. Let me have your handcuffs, will you? Yeah, here. The bartender? Yeah. He copped out to giving Walt Gilmer the bad junk. Huh. That well, takes care of it then, huh? Yeah. Come on, let's get him to the car. All right. Come on, get up. Well, I'm glad this one's over. Yeah. Well, you don't look any the worse for wear. All right. Sure. You didn't really have anything to worry about. Is that right? Well, sure. You don't mind me telling you that, do you? It's a good thing you weren't two minutes later. Huh? I might not have heard you. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. Dolores Marie Page and Alfred Giles Harnett were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. David Alcott Flack was tried and convicted of using narcotics, and Earl Tyler Rockland was tried and convicted of possession of narcotics. They all received sentence as prescribed by law. Murder in the first degree is punishable by life imprisonment in the state penitentiary. Possession of narcotics, first offense, is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. Using narcotics is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Yeah. Well, I 
on him. Sweat it out tonight. He'll feel different in the morning, maybe. Oh, I hope you're right. Anything come in? Uh-uh. As soon as I finish up this log, we can shove off if you want to. All right. You going right home? Hmm? I say you're going right home. Well, I thought maybe I'd go by the city hall. I'd like to see Danny Galindo for a minute. Uh-huh. What, are you going to eat then? Yeah, I'll probably grab some. You want to go? Might as well. kind of hungry. I don't like to wake Faye up. She sleeps kind of light, you know. She always wakes up when I get to rattling around the kitchen. Yeah. Maybe stop and have a poached egg and some corned beef hash. How's that sound to you? Like a poached egg and some corned beef hash. Well, I'm not kidding. I'm hungry. Are you about finished there? Yeah. I want to see Danny before he leaves. What well, is it? Something special? No, I heard that he had a set of golf clubs for sale. I thought maybe I'd look at them. Are you going to start playing golf? No. I thought maybe I'd take a look at them. I got it. Juvenile Division Friday. Yes, ma'am, that's right. What's that address? All right, no. No, we'll find it. We'll try not to worry. We'll be right there. Yes, ma'am. Bye. Well, that food of yours is going to have to wait. What? Thirteen-year-old kid's missing. And probably at a neighbor's. Uh, her mother thinks she's been kidnapped. Frank and I left the office immediately, and we drove out to the address I'd been given on the phone. The caller had told me that her 13-year-old daughter was missing from the house. We parked our car a block from the place and walked the rest of the way in the event that the house might be watched. 12463 Courtney Terrace was a large house above Hollywood Boulevard. When we got there, all of the lights were on. Frank waited while I went up to the front door, and after a few minutes, he joined me. We were admitted to the house by a tall man in his early 40s who identified himself as the missing girl's father, Gilbert Moran. He asked us to come into the den of the house where he gave us the story. My wife's with the doctor. She went all to pieces when it finally hit her. Yes, sir. Now, have you checked with the girl's friends? Yes, sir. Gladys called them all. None of them have seen her. How about the neighbors? Oh, we've talked to them, too. They just can't tell us anything. You've got to find her. Yes, sir. We'll do our best, Miss Marina. You want to start at the beginning and tell us what happened? Yeah. Do you want a cigarette? No, you go ahead. I have one here. How about you? No, I have one. Here's a match. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, thank you. All right, sir. Do you want to tell us what happened? Well, Gladys and I went to a show tonight down on the boulevard. We left Bunny here doing her homework. Bunny? That's your daughter? Yes, sir. Her name's really Lucille, but the kids at grammar school tagged her Bunny, and she's been called that ever since. Uh Uh-huh. What time did you get here? It must have been about 11.40, somewhere near there. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that your daughter was gone right away? No, sir. Not at first. I locked up, and then Gladys and I went upstairs. We checked Bunny's room, and she was gone. I see. Gladys started to think all kinds of things. Mm Mm-hmm. I tried to calm her down. We got Bunny's telephone book and started to call her friends. We know most of them. They hadn't seen her. Finally, I thought it'd be wrong to wait any longer, and we called you. All right, sir. Now, do you want to give us a description of your girl? Would you wait just a minute? I'd like to talk to the doctor and see if Gladys is all right. Yes, sir. You go right ahead. She was terribly upset. Yes, sir. We understand. What do you think? I don't know. Big house, nice neighborhood. Looks like he's pretty well fixed, doesn't he? Yeah. Nothing about a contact yet. The girl's only been gone a couple hours. The doctor's giving her a sedative. She's still pretty much upset. Yes, sir. Now, what if you give us that description? Well, she's 13 and about right for her age. Well, how do you mean, sir? She's about 4 feet 8, weighs around 80 pounds. What color's her hair? Dark blonde. She was always after her mother to let her use one of those rinses to make it lighter. Gladys said she should wait. I see. How about her eyes? Sort of brown, light. We used to tell her that she had honey-colored eyes, a sort of golden brown, real long eyelashes. Now, can you remember what she was wearing? Well, let me think. Well, as I remember, sir, she had on a pair of clam diggers, sir. Clam diggers, short slacks. Oh. They're about right here. I short. Uh huh. What color? Denim, sort of light blue. I see. You know, white blouse. Sort of like a man's shirt. How about shoes? Well, I think they were, uh... Gosh, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't remember. Now, is it possible she might have changed her clothes before she left? She didn't leave, Sergeant. She was taken out of here. I'm sure it wasn't her idea. All right, sir, we understand. Is there anything else about your daughter that would make it easier for us to identify her? I can't think of anything. All right. Frank, what if you call us in, please? Yeah. Uh, May I use your phone, Mr. Moran? Certainly. Where is it, please? Right through that door. There's an alcove in the hall. All right. The light switch is on the right, just behind the door. Thanks, sir. Say, wait a minute. Yes, sir? I forgot about Skippy. Who's that? Skippy, the dog. Bunny's dog. He's gone, too. Is that right? He must be with Bunny. First time I thought of him. He's usually right with her all the time. I haven't seen him since we got home. What kind of an animal is he? Golden Cocker, about four years old. Bunny got him for her ninth birthday. I see. Better call on in, too, huh? Yeah. Now, I wonder if I could see her room. Oh, sure. It's upstairs. This way? Mm-hmm. I hope you're not going to be angry, Mr. Moran. What? Has there been any trouble here in your home that might have affected the girl? What do you mean? Well, any arguments, disagreements, anything that might have upset her? No. No. 
Upstairs? Yes. How about boyfriends? You mean does Bunny have any? That's right. Well, there are a couple of kids in her class he has over once in a while. She's not allowed any nighttime dates. I see. Once in a while on a weekend, we go to a show and take one of the kids with us. Is there any one boy that she sees more than the others? Oh, no. Gladys and I both think she's too young for that. It's down this way, Sergeant. All right. This is her room. When we left, she was sitting right there at the desk. You can see how there's paper scattered all over. Yeah. Looks a little like there was a struggle, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. And she wouldn't do a thing like this if you just walked out. No, sir. Where does this door lead over here? Outside to a walk that runs around the house. Locked. Was it this way when you came home? Oh, yes, sir. I didn't touch a thing as soon as I realized she was gone. The radio was still on? Mm, I told you. I didn't touch a thing. Right, sir. She's been kidnapped, Sergeant. Somebody took her out of this house. Wait a minute, Mr. Moran. What is it? What you found? Something under the bed here, doesn't it? It's your dog, Skippy. Yeah. Looks like he's been beaten to death, doesn't it? Frank called the office and the description of the missing girl was broadcast. Captain Warren Stilson was contacted and he sent a crew of men out to the house to go over the room for physical evidence. The telephone company was contacted and arrangements were made for an extension phone to be placed in the same room as the existing instrument. In this manner, if the kidnapper should attempt to make contact with Moran, we could relay instructions to him easily. All of these preparations, however, were made with the thought that the house might be under surveillance by the person or persons who had taken the child. A team of men from Georgia Street Juvenile was sent out to the house and a 24-hour watch was set up. Frank and I began to talk to the neighbors and friends of the Morans. None of them could shed any light on the missing teenager. By four minutes to six on Sunday morning, there still had been no attempt at communication by the kidnappers. By this time, the girl's description had been given out to all officers in the city who might come in contact with her. Although when we talked with the neighbors, we'd asked them to keep the inquiries in strictest confidence, one of them had gotten in touch with a local newspaper. And before we had a chance to stop it, the news of Bunny Moran's disappearance was out. The other papers in the city picked up the news, and by noon on Sunday, special editions were on the streets. 1.40 p.m. Still no word from the girl's abductors. Her friends were re-questioned without results. All of the people who knew her or who had any dealings with her were interrogated. Still no leads. The examination by members of the crime lab turned up no usable evidence. They established that the dog had been killed with a metal bookend. The Federal Bureau of Investigation was contacted, and they assigned a team of agents to work with us. By 6.20 p.m., Mrs. Moran was in a state of complete collapse. The entire city and the state were looking for a 13-year-old daughter. A roundup of all known deviates was started. 10.38 p.m., Frank and I got back to the office. I'll check the book. All right. Is Skipper in? No, I don't think so. Hargrove said he went over to City Hall meeting with Chief Brown and Lorman. Mm-hmm. Anything in the book? Wait a minute, let's see. He has a couple of calls. Nothing that can't wait, though. Well, you better call Faye, hadn't you, and tell her where you are? Yeah, I guess. I want to tag by Leighton Prince before we go out to the house. Yeah. Check with the FBI? Yeah. They got the description of all of the border points. None of the guards remember seeing the girl. I figure she's still in the state then. Oh, hi, honey. That's me. Mm-hmm. I know. Well, I didn't get a chance. Well, I figured you'd read it. And you don't know. Uh, oh, okay, pretty beat. Yeah, it's yours, too. No, nothing yet. What's that? Well, you know I can't talk about that, honey. Yeah. Yeah, well, don't worry. No, a little headache, yeah. I'll take some action. Well, look, I'll call you first chance I get. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. Then. Worried, huh? Yeah, she always is when I'm late. Let's go, huh? Yeah, let's go. I get it. Juvenile Division, Friday. How long ago? Where? Right, we'll wait here. Yeah. No, I'll call him. He's over Chief Brown. Mm-hmm. We'll wait. Yeah, bye. What do you got? Kidnapper made contact. A note? Uh uh-uh. uh. He called and wanted to talk to Moran. Druggist heard him make the call and notified Hollywood Division. Yeah. He's in custody now. Frank and I waited until the suspect was brought into the office for questioning. He'd been apprehended in a drugstore while he was on the phone talking to Mr. Moran. A radio card picked him up and driven him over to Georgia Street Juvenile. We called Captain Powers at the city hall and he immediately came to the office. At 10.56 p.m., the suspect arrived. He was taken to the office of the night watch commander for questioning. 
All right. What's your name? You're the cop. You tell me. Take everything out of your pockets. What is this, a shakedown? Don't you hear good? All right. There's my wallet. Any money in it? A couple of bucks. Take it out. What are you doing, playing a lucky dollar contest? Keep the money in your hands. Put the wallet on the table. Get the other pockets out. Nothing in them. Let us worry about that. All right. Change. Here's a comb. Handkerchief. Clean, too. Matches. Cigarettes. Here's a pen and pencil set. A couple more pennies. That's it. Want to check it, Joe? Mm. This is your wallet. It was in my pocket. I asked you if it was yours. Yeah. Driver's license here. That's your true name. Better read it so you can have it in the record. Mark Lawrence Lansdale. That's your true name. That's what it says. You still live at the same address? Yeah. I'm going to ask you one question, Lansdale. I want the right answer. What do I get if I come up with a winner? Where's the Moran girl? I don't know what you're talking about. And you better find out. Thirteen-year-old kid's missing. You called her parents and asked for $50,000 for a return. Now, where's the girl? I thought you arrested guys for using the needle. Answer the question, mister. If I had it, you'd get it. All right, mister. I'm going to ask you once more. Where's the girl? I don't know what you're talking about. You think you're pretty big, don't you? I'll answer that one for you. You do that, will you? You say this girl's been kidnapped. All right? This is your party. Uh, you say you can prove that I made a call asking for 50000 bucks. Uh, so far, I'm on the right track. All right. Then it figures that if you're so sure I got something to do with it, if I'm here, the girl's in trouble, don't it? Go ahead. If I don't turn up, something bad's likely to happen to her. True? You're still on. Well, if it's like I say that I don't know anything about it, then you're going to have to turn me loose anyway. I got nothing to worry about, cop. You keep me here and your prized kids might land up in a ditch. You let me go and maybe you got a chance of getting it back. I'm going to spell it out for you, Lanzo, and you listen good. There's nothing getting you out of here, nothing. I got two kids of my own, and I know how those parents feel. I'm on their side. If anything happens to that girl, you won't forget it for the rest of your life. And if I've got anything to say about it, that won't be very long. I'll pull every string I know to see that I get to take you to the joint and strap you in the chair myself. If you've harmed that kid in any way, you won't live long enough to regret it. Big man with a badge. I get it. Juvenile Friday. He's right here. Where? All right, I'll tell him. Go on. All right, all right, bye. The Hollywood station, Skipper. Yeah? They found the girl. The call had come from the Hollywood police station telling us that the Moran girl had been found. We contacted Lieutenant Hartgrove and had Mark Lansdale held for further questioning. Frank, Captain Powers, and I left the office and drove to the Court and Terrace address where the girl had been taken. When we got there, there was a uniformed officer standing by the front door. We went in and found Mr. and Mrs. Moran with their daughter, Bunny, waiting for us. The girl appeared to be all right. Her face was dirty and scratched. Her clothing was torn, but she appeared to be in good health. Are you hungry, dear? Would you like a bowl of soup or something? Well, it's not too much trouble. Not at all, honey. I'll get it right away. Now, you stop when you get tired. I will, Mother. You want to go ahead, Bunny? Yes. Where do you want me to begin? What happened on Saturday night? Daddy and Mother went to a show. I was upstairs doing my homework. I see. I guess I was up there a half an hour, maybe more. Seems like that long. Hard to tell when you're doing work, you know. Yeah. Anyway, the first thing I knew, it was somebody at the front door. I heard the bell and went downstairs. There were two men there. I see. And they asked if my mother and father were home. I told them, no, that they'd gone out. Mm-hmm. And then they told me that they knew that all the time. Said there'd been some kind of an accident and that I should go with them right away. Said it was an emergency. And you went with him, did you? Yeah. I went upstairs to my room to get coat. I wanted to make sure Skippy was all right. Yeah. One of them went with me. While I was getting my coat, I remembered that sometimes kidnappers tell people there's been an accident so they can take them away. You know how they do. That was good thinking, Bunny. Would you go ahead, please, miss? I asked the man who followed me where Mom and Dad were, what hospital. Mm-hmm. He said they were in a hospital. They'd been taken to some kind of an emergency place. He said that they were not in a hospital? No, right? he said they'd been taken to some sort of emergency oh, I place. All right. Go ahead, please. Well, when I asked him for the name of the place, he wouldn't tell me. Just said I should hurry up, and my folks had been hurt pretty bad. It was a dirty lie. Anyway, I told him I wouldn't go, and he grabbed me. He said he was going to take me. She'd like to get my hands on him. Was the other man downstairs all this time? Well, I guess so. I didn't see him. All right, go ahead, Miss. Please. Here's your soup, honey. Now drink it while it's still hot. Oh, kind. It's black bean, just like you like it. Go on now, I'm hot. 
Oh, there's some nice crackers there, too. Thanks, Mother. Mm, that's good. I'm hungry. Would you like to go ahead, Miss Lee? Uh, can't you let her eat? Poor child, after what she's been through. There's another man out, Mrs. Moran. We've got to find him. He's right, Gladys. Well, you go ahead and eat while you're talking. Yes, Mother. And not too fast. All right. Please go ahead, Miss. Well, when he grabbed me, Skippy, that's my dog, he got sore. Got real mad when he saw the man grab me, and he jumped at the man, tried to bite him. I see. The man hit Skippy, grabbed him and hit him a lot. I guess he killed him, I don't know. What happened then? Well, he took me out the car. It's parked outside in front of the house. Did you get a good look at the car? Mm-hmm. You can give us a description of it then. Yeah, I can tell you all about it. All right, where'd the men take you? Well, they drove for a long time. I think it's up in the hill someplace, up in Laurel Canyon. Mm-hmm. There's just kind of a house there, tar paper. Looks like the buildings they had when they were building the freeway. Tar paper shacks, like the, you know, they keep the blueprints in. Mm-hmm. One of those didn't even have a floor, just dirt. They put me in there and left me. I heard them lock the door when they went away. I see. I didn't know what to do. Sat there for a little while and tried to think what to do. Did they have you tied in any way? Yeah, they had ropes around my hands and around my feet. Mm -hmm. I fell asleep after a while. Cried for a while and then fell asleep. Oh, my poor baby. I guess it was morning when I woke up. I couldn't tell too good because there wasn't any window in the shack, just the walls and no floor. Mm -hmm. First, when I woke up, I, I didn't know where I was and I remembered. Did either of the men come back at all? No, I sat there for a while and then I tried to think of some way I could get away. Yeah. There was a whiskey bottle on the floor, and I kicked it until I broke it. Then I took one of the pieces and cut the ropes on my hands. I untied my feet and then just went around the shack, kicking the walls until I found a place that wasn't strong. I found one, and I crawled through. Mm -hmm. What'd you do then? I started to walk. It was pretty late by that time, and I started to walk down the road. I was looking for a house. Mm -hmm. I got to a street and walked along it for a while. There weren't many cars, but a truck came along, and a driver stopped and gave me a lift. Drove me to Laurel and Hollywood Boulevard and then let me out. Yeah. After that, I walked home. You were real brave, honey. I was pretty scared. There were a lot of times I didn't know what to do. You just bet there were, baby. But you did good. You're safe now. Can you describe the two men for us, do you think? I guess so. One of them was dark, kind of short, looked like... Oh, what's his name? You see him on television all the time. Real mean looking. I'll think of his name. Looks exactly like him. Mm -hmm. What about the other one? He wasn't very big either, kind of brown hair, thin, had blue eyes, watery blue eyes. Were those the only two men you saw? Yeah, just the two. Did they talk about anybody else being in on the kidnapping with them, do you remember? Not that I could hear. You're sure about that, are you? Yes. Sergeant, what's so important about that? Well, sir, we've got a man in custody, the one who called you. Yes? Neither one of these descriptions match him. <laughs> We continued to talk to the Moran girl. We got a complete description of both men involved and of the car they used. Local and APBs were gotten out on them. The fact that the descriptions varied and did not match the suspect we had in custody meant very little. A witness or a victim under stress might easily be mistaken. We talked with a family doctor, and he told us that after a good night's sleep, the girl would be able to cooperate with us completely. The following morning, Monday, April 19th, a special show-up was arranged at the main jail. Our suspect was placed in a line with other men in custody. Bunny Moran failed to identify him. Frank and I took her over to the city hall and had her look through mug shots that had been pulled from packages as a result of a run by the stats office. She was unable to point out a suspect. 1.40 p.m. We asked her if she could show us the shack where she'd been held captive. She said she could. We called her parents and told them where we were going, and then we left the office. We picked up a policewoman and drove out the freeway to Sunset Boulevard and turned off. When we got to Laurel Canyon Boulevard, we drove past Lookout Mountain Avenue, and then we turned left onto a dirt road. We drove for about a mile and a half. There was no sign of any type of building. It's right up ahead, around the next corner. You sure you're on the right road? Yeah, I remember walking down this one. That's right. Uh -huh. Hey, that's as far as we can go. Is that it? Maybe I did make a mistake. Maybe I did. I was sure it was along here, but maybe I was wrong. It might have been the next road up. You know, the one past where we turned off? Uh-huh. You want to turn around, Frank? Yeah. I'm sure I'm sorry about it. That's all right, miss. Guess it seems like a wild goose chase, huh? No. Sure hope not. I know where it is. I just got mixed up. All right. We'll find it. I'm sure we will. Mm-hmm. Can't just disappear, can it? No, not likely. It's here someplace. You'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We went 
back to Laurel Canyon Boulevard and drove up all of the dirt roads in the vicinity. We didn't find the shack. Each time, Bunny Moran would offer some excuse. Finally, we asked her to describe the truck that had picked her up. She gave us a description that would fit two or three hundred vehicles in the city. She was unable to tell us the name of the driver who'd stopped. We took her back to the office and asked her to go over the story again. When she finished, Frank left to get Captain Powers. All right, you want to tell us now? What do you mean? The real story, the way it really happened. Might be easier if you told us first, don't you think? I told you there isn't any more to tell. I told you all how it happened. Why are you lying? <laughs> I'm not lying. No, it happened. Now, look, there are half a dozen places where the story you just told us doesn't fit with what you said last night. I was tired last night. Maybe I didn't remember. That's kind of hard to buy. Hmm? Too many things that don't check out, miss. The story about your dog, the fact that you can't find the shack, you don't know who the driver of the truck was. There are a lot of things. I forgot. That's all. I made a mistake. Didn't you ever make a mistake? A lot of them. But last night you said only one of the men went upstairs with you. Now, isn't that right? I don't remember. You seemed pretty sure about it then. And I guess that's what I said. Only one of the men went with you, huh? That's what I said, yes. Well, then why, when you told the story just now, did you say that both of them went with you? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. You're getting me all mixed up. Did you kill your dog? Did you? Yes. Why? I had to. To make the story sound real, I... I didn't want to, but I had to. So why'd you do it at all, miss? So they wouldn't mind. That's the reason. What do you mean, so who wouldn't mind? You'll think it's silly. You won't think it's a good reason. Why'd you tell me anyway, huh? Because I was failing. What? I flunked at school. I flunked and I didn't want my folks to know. They'd be real mad. Real mad. So you figured this kid and everything out, huh? Played it that way. Yes. I thought that if something bad happened to me, they'd be so glad to have me back, it wouldn't matter about my flunking. The whole thing was a lie from the beginning to end, huh? Yes. All of it. All right, next time we better get going. Where? We'll take you home. You gonna tell my folks about it? We haven't got much choice, have we? They'll be mad. Matter than they've ever been. Well, I guess they will. Will I tell them? What'll I say? Well, I'll tell you. Why don't you try something different? Hmm? Tell them the truth. Present at the meeting were Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert Moran and their daughter Lucille. It was decided that no criminal complaint be issued and the girl was released to the custody of her parents with the understanding that she be given psychiatric help. Further investigation showed Mark Parkwell Lansdale was wanted by authorities in Sacramento to answer a burglary charge. He was released to them. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. (laughs) 